let's think this through. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Testing, 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 testing. Cubaan satu dua tiga. Testing, testing. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rabbi syrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlan uqdatan min lisani yafqaw qawli Allah ma'alimni ma jahiltu wa zakirni ma nasitu Hadirin dan hadirat yang dirahmati Allah sekalian bersyukur pada Allah Azza wa Jalla kerana pada malam ni kita diberikan kesempatan untuk memeriahkan salah satu taman syurga di mana insyaAllah kita akan mendengar sedikit ilmu daripada seorang insan hebat seorang tokoh dunia yang sangat berpengaruh tetapi sebelum kita teruskan acara Suka saya uh, memperkenalkan sebut sedikit tentang Siapakah tetamu kita Dan insya Allah tuan-tuan Orang Paleh ni boleh berbahasa, boleh berbahasa orang putih ya eh, tuan-tuan Kita speaking malam ni insya Allah Siapa kata orang Paleh tak boleh speaking Orang Kelatai pun boleh juga tak Ladies and gentlemen Members of the floor We are very honored tonight because We have a very great person. We have a very great guest that will be delivering his speech tonight. And I would like to give a brief introduction about Dr. Zaki Naik. Dr. Zaki Naik is a medical doctor by professional training. Dr. Zaki Naik is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the founder of Peace TV Network, the largest religious satellite channel network in the world. He is, 50, he, he is 56 years old. Dr. Zaki Naik clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 26 years, Dr. Zaki Naik has delivered over 2,000 public talks in the USA, Canada, UK, Italy, France, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, Egypt, Yemen, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia, Algeria, Morocco, Sri Lanka, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Hong Kong, China, Japan, And many, and many more countries including Trinidad and Mauritius, Maldives and many other countries in addition to numerous public talks in India. In April 2012, his public talk in Kishan, Kish, Kishanjaj, Kishanganj, Bihar in India was Alhamdulillah attended by over 1 million people by one of the largest gathering in the world for any religious lecture by a single orator. Alhamdulillah His talk in Jakarta, Indonesia in April 2017 and in Kota Baru, Kelantan, Malaysia in August 2019 attracted more than 100,000 people. Amongst the billions plus population of India, Alhamdulillah, Dr. Zaki Naik was, rank, was ranked number 82 in the 100 most influential per people in India, list published by Indian Express in the year 2009 and ranked number 89 in 2010 he was ranked number three in the top 10 spiritual gurus of india in 2009 and topped the list in 2010 he is ranked amongst the top 70 in the book of the most 500 influential muslims in the world published by georgetown university in the last 11 editions from 2011 to 2021 in the list of the top 100 cumulative influence over 10 years, Dr. Zaki Naik was ranked number 79. By Allah's help, he has successfully participated in several symposiums and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of USA on the topic the Quran and the Bible in the light of science held by Chicago USA in April 2000 
was resounding success. His interfaith dialogue with prominent Hindu guru Sri, da Sri Ravi Shankar and on the topic of the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of sacred scriptures held at Palace Grounds, Bangalore on the 21st January 2006 was highly appreciated by people of both religions. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, the world-famous orator on Islam and comparative religion who had called Dr. Zaki Naik as Didat Plus in 1994, presented a plaque in May 2000 with the engraving awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik for his achievement in the field of da'wah and the study of comparative religion. He said, Son, what you have done in four years had taken me more than 40 years to accomplish, alhamdulillah. Sheikh Muhammad bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President of Prime Minister of UAE and Ruler of Dubai, Alhamdulillah, presented the prestigious Dubai International Holy Quran Awards Islamic Personality of 2013 Award on, two, on the 29th July 2013 for providing outstanding services to Islam and Muslims at a global level in media, education and philanthropy to Dr. Zakir Naik, along with a cash reward of UAE dirhams, 1 million US, 272,000, which he promptly donated to start a Waqaf Endowment Fund for Peace TV Network. Dr. Zakir, at 47 years old, was the youngest recipient of the award. And one more thing, ladies and gentlemen, especially the people of Perlis, our Agong, our previous Agong, Tuanku Abdul Halim Mu'azam Shah, the King and Head of State of Malaysia conferred Dr. Zaki Naik the highest award of Malaysia which is Tokoh Ma'al Hijrah Distinguished International Personality Award for the year 2013 for his, for his significant service and contribution to the development of Islam on the 5th November 2013. Also presented to Dr. Zaki was a citation plaque signed by the Prime Minister of Malaysia Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak. Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Muhammad Al Qasimi, ruler of Sharjah, presented Dr. Zaki Naik the Sharjah Award for voluntary work for the year of 2013 on 16 January 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, kalau nak baca ni memang sampai habis tak sudah tuan tuan. So without further ado, I would like to invite the one and only Dr. Zaki Naik to present his speech to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Members of the floor, please welcome Dr. Zaki Naik. For information, ladies and gentlemen, after his talk, we will open for a Q&A session, right? And all of you will be given the rules and regulation so that we can help the Q&A session accordingly, inshallah. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Zaki Naik. Can I have second camera, husband? Second camera. The mid. Mid, mid. 
the mid had the mid 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 camera the last one the three fourth sign the mid one the mid camera hadi are you put hadi have you hadi the last camera should be three close mid yes hadi you made a mistake yes that's fine little bit wide bit more wide yes perfect fine okay, can i show the 3/4 okay can i have a look a 3/4 can be a little bit tight or oh, fine it's fine it's fine and the last one okay that's fine okay <clears throat> Alhamdulillah Was salatu was salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain amma ba'd a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa man ahsanu qawla mimman da'a ila allah wa amilu salihan wa qala innani minal muslimin maqru maqra allah wa allahu khairul maqrin rabbi shalli sadri wa yassir li amri Wahlul Uqdatam Min Lisani Yafqah Kauli. I welcome all the people present in this Putra Mosque in Kanganga Palace, as well as the millions of viewers that are watching on the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, and the Peace TV Chinese, as well as the social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, and the Alida platform. I welcome. all of you with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god be on all of you <clears throat> it is my pleasure and my honor to be once again back to perlis after gap of more than 2 years I have come here several times in 2017, 2018 and 2019 and because of this pandemic the covid-19 in 2020 and 21 I did not give any talks all my talks had been cancelled or postponed and alhamdulillah I'm lucky that in the beginning of this new year 2022 Amongst all the invitations that were pending, Alhamdulillah, this is my first talk after the pandemic has reduced. Alhamdulillah, it's my pleasure to be back with the people of Perlis. I think Perlis has become my second home. and about 9 days ago the mufti of perlis dato mohammad asri zainul abidin mella protect him he called me to discuss on the topic of today's talk and he suggested that i speak on the topic Zakir Naik my life and my story initially i was reluctant because of falling into the trap of satan as many of you may be aware that one of the major sins in islam is riya it is arrogance it is pride and the satan is specifically behind those people who are successful and closer to allah so we as dais should be very careful not to fall in the plan of the satan and i would not like to be among those people who blowing their own trumpet and falling into this but 
Dr. Maza, as he's called in the short form, the Mufti of Perlis, mashallah, very knowledgeable person and very close to me, and explained to me that the purpose is so that I can inspire the Muslim Ummah, the youngsters and the others to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I agreed with him, reminding me of the incidents in the year 2015 when I went to take advice from Sheikh Abdul Aziz Tarefi. According to me, amongst the living Islamic scholars in the world, according to me, one of the greatest living Islamic scholars today in the world is Sheikh Abdul Aziz Tarefi. And he's very close to me because there was an advisor of mine and we have been even taking advice from McKinsey. I don't know how many of you are aware of McKinsey. It is one of the most reputed consultation firm in the world, which has branches in most parts of the world. So one of the advisors, they told me that if you want to increase in Dava, you have to make a brief profile of yourself. Make a book talking about yourself. And they advised me to make a book, Dr. Zakir, a brief introduction. And I was reluctant. They being expert in the field of advertising and marketing, they are doing their job. I was reluctant. And when the book was made by my staff, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, it came out very well. Hardcover, very good paper, very good printing, something unique. But I was scared. I was scared to give it to anyone, thinking that I may lose all the thawab that I have gained, whatever little bit in my life of serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when I went to Sheikh Abdul Aziz Tarefi and I told him that this was the advice I got from my advisor, from McKinsey, and I'm not feeling happy giving this book to anyone. He said, why? Because I don't want to, you know, be falling into the trap of pride, of riyah, of arrogance. So Sheikh Abdul Aziz, to, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Tarefi told me, because you're thinking you're feeling bad, that itself shows that you're not proud of yourself, number one. The moment you're feeling bad, that you don't want to give this book to anyone, itself is a sign that you're not doing it for arrogant surprise. Number two, he said the advice given to you was for what purpose? So I told him so that my dawah activity would increase, the people would come to know about my activities and the support would increase, and the reach would be more. Because that book had a lot of achievements, a lot of awards, photographs with heads of states of the world, with top scholars. It came out to be so good that I was afraid. After taking the advice of Sheikh Abdul Aziz Tarefi, then I was a little bit relaxed, and I thought to it that I didn't make it public, but gave it only to those people who I thought would benefit the dawah. Nine days back, when the Mufti of Perlis, Dr. Maza, as he's called by the people who love him, he again came up with the same hikmah, that the purpose is not to show off. And he told me that when you give your life story, many a times people who are successful, they don't tell their story and it is lost. When you say it with your own mouth, many things would inspire the Muslim Ummah and we can make small clips of five minutes, three minutes, four minutes for your full talk. We can make clips so that that would inspire the people all over the world. I told him, Mufti, talking about my life would minimum take two hours. He said, no problem. And I agreed with the suggestion. And today's topic is Zakir Naik, my life and my story. 
from a stammerer to an Islamic orator and Hijra from India to Malaysia. Later on, when I started to gather my thought, what should I speak? I realized it's impossible to cover in two hours. I require minimum five hours. Then when I thought more, no, I require 10 hours. Then when I thought more, I said, no, 20 hours. Then I said, impossible, minimum 25 hours. And but naturally, I can't give a talk for 25 hours. So now I'm in a dilemma. How can I finish my life and my story in two hours? So let me tell you, this will just be scratching the surface. But I decided that inshallah, in the coming few months, I would give a series of talk in my studio. In Putraja, maybe for more than 25 hours, trying to fulfill a little bit what Dr. Maza wanted. So that, you know, we can make small clips. 25 hours or more than that. So it will, it will not be lost in wilderness. And I know many a times it would be an inspiration for youngsters. Because today we have two types of thought about dyes. Where I come from India, a dai means miskin. Poor person. Not having knowledge of the world at all. Not coming from madrasa. A different angle to it. When we go to some parts of the world where Muslims are majority, they make dawah as a profession to earn money, these extremes, and they charge a lot. So these are two extremes which we have. Inshallah, maybe my life and my story would be an example for the people to become dais. Let me tell you one thing in the beginning, and I'll conclude with that also, that never ever become a dai so that you can earn money in this world. As a profession, no problem. That doesn't mean you can't take salary. Because all of us know the very famous dua that we do from the Quran. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasnata wa fil akhirata wa hasnata kina azab bin nar. Oh my Lord! Give me the best in this world and the akhirah and save me from the torment of the hellfire. Who doesn't know this dua? MashaAllah. Who knows this dua? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. MashaAllah. Everyone. Everyone knows this dua. MashaAllah. Very famous dua. Now, can anyone from here who's not a hafiz can tell me what this dua is from the glorious Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 201. You may not know the reference, I'm telling you. Does anyone know what comes one verse before this? Raise your hand. Who knows what does Allah say in the Quran, one verse before this dua? Raise your hand. Anyone who's not a Hafiz of Quran, Anyone who is not a Hafiz of Quran, who knows what Allah says in the Quran, one verse before this. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 200, that there are those who pray only for this dunya. Allah will give you the dunya, but will not give you akhara. Then Allah says, the believers are those who pray, Rabbana, atina, fit dunya, hasnato, fil akhara, hasnato, kina, Oh my Lord, give me the best in this world and the akhara and save me from the torment of hellfire. There's a scholar who rightly said that even in this dua, Allah is teaching us the maximum you ask for this dunya is one third. Rabbana atina fit dunya, give me the best in this world. Rabbana atina fit dunya wa hasnato wa fil akhirato wa hasnato. Give me the best in this world and the best in the hereafter. And this is the one third, next one third. And the last one third is, save me from the torment of hellfire. So one third is for this dunya, next one third is the best in next dunya, and the last one third is also, save me from the torment of hellfire. 
So two third is for the Akhira and one third is for this dunya. So the best dua that we have that Allah has taught us in the Quran is one third you ask for this dunya and two third for the Akhira. Allah says in Surah Hud that all those who ask for this dunya, we give you this dunya but not Akhira. But those who ask for Akhira, Allah gives you an Akhira as well as this world. Please let me inform you that before I start my life and my story, let me tell you this talk in no way to enumerate the good qualities that I have. I don't think so, I have many. In no way is it to list the awards that I got. In no way it is to talk about my achievement. Let me tell you, all whatever little bit I have is hazam in fazli rabbi. This is only and only because of my Lord. Without Allah, I am zero. That is the reason on my WhatsApp DP, I have only one DP. Those who have my WhatsApp number. On my WhatsApp DP, I am nothing without Allah. So let me tell you at the outset, Dr. Zakir Naik is zero. Whatever little bit that I've achieved in this life is only and only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah you will learn that if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah helps, if Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? This is the verse of the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 160, which is number one most important for all Muslims in all activities, whether it be dawah, whether it be worldly, whether it be akhira. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 160, if Allah helps you, none can forsake you. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there, then who can help you? So let the believers, let the moments put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The success of everything is only and only due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will try my level best in this limited two hours that I've got to try and say highlights of some of, you know, because my experiences, mashallah, Allah has blessed me with a lot of experiences which is worth sharing, which would take scores of us, more than 25 hours according to me. I'll just say some of them. I will try and narrate in a chronological order, your wife. But sometimes I may have to club a few years together and then come back so that the sequence is maintained. But I'll try and narrate my story in a chronological order year wise. But sometimes, you know, I may have to club a few things together rather than come back and forth again up and down. So mostly it will be chronological order. Sometimes I'll go a few years ahead and then come back again. Inshallah, I'll try my level best to speak about Zakir Naik, my life, my story, a stammerer, from a stammerer to an Islamic orator, and hijra from India to Malaysia. I, Zakir Abdul Karim Naik, was born on the 18th of October, 1965, in the city of Bombay, today known as Mumbai, in the state of Maharashtra, in India. Today, I am 56 years, 2 months, and 28 days young. My parents, both my parents, they were highly educated. They were broad-minded, and they were practicing Muslims. But even though they were practicing Muslims, they never forced any of us, any of my brothers and sisters, including me, to follow 
any of the faraiz in Islam. They never forced us. But they were practicing Muslims. So much so that I remember the first time when I observed the fast at the age of three or four, it was against the wishes of my parents. Because they said, how could a three-year-old person fast? But I wanted to fast and it was against my wishes. I saw my mother praying. I used to join her. They never told me to pray. And Alhamdulillah, we were a practicing Muslim following the faraiz, abstaining from haram. Me along with my siblings, we were five, two brothers and three sisters. The eldest was my sister, her name was Zubna. Her name is Zubna rather. Next is my elder brother, Muhammad. Then my second sister, Naila. My third sister, Salva. And then me, Zakir. I was the youngest amongst all five. And being the youngest was a little bit more pampered. I did my schooling in St. Peter's High School in Masgon, Bombay, India. Though St. Peter's High School was managed by a Christian Protestant organization, educational organization, more than 80% of the students we were Muslims. It was a co ed school. And from school days, I used to avoid talking to girls. I never spoke to any of my classmates who were girls or schoolmates, not because there was any restriction from the deen or from Islam. It was my innate nature not to intermingle with opposite sex. From childhood, I used to stammer. From childhood, from the time I can recollect, I used to stammer. When anyone used to ask me, what is your name? I would say, my name is Za, 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 Zakir. I was, you could say, a born stammerer. Or another English word is stutterer. I used to stutter from childhood. And there are different people who stammer some mild, some moderate. I was an excessive stammerer. So much so that whenever I used to reply, I used to even jump. So when someone asked me, what is the name of my name? Is, da, 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 then lock it. So until I did not jump, that keyword would not come out. And I remember many a time when I stood below the doorknob, because I was short young, and when I used to stammer, and when I used to jump, I used to get a lump on my head. So I was a stammerer, and everyone knew that. So the biggest defect that was there, that I had, and amongst my friend circle, was that I was a stammerer. So it was like a psychological block for me. And in school, mashallah, I was very good in studies, always got every year awards, books, and I was very good in mathematics. Almost all the years I got the best in mathematics award. But there was a subject in our school called as public speaking. And I used to get PF. PF means pass fail. Because the teachers used to have pity on me. Poor stammerer. Poor stutterer. So we'll just pass fail. PF. And I was known. That was my biggest drawback in school. A stammerer. But Alhamdulillah otherwise in studies. Mashallah. I, after I passed my school, I joined the Science Junior College, that is Kishanchand Chilaram College, KC College, in Churchgate, Mumbai. And I finished my 11th and 12th. I did my science, and it was my desire since school days to become a doctor, like my father, and become a surgeon. 
So I did my science stream, and then I was later on admitted to the Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College in Belgaum, in Karnataka. The medical college is for three academic years. Each academic year is for one and a half calendar year. So it's the four and a half year studies, then one year internship. I finished my first academic year and two terms of the second year, and I took transfer to Bombay. And then I joined the Topiwala National Medical College in Bombay, in Bombay Central, also called as Nair Hospital. So I took a transfer in the second year, in 1987. I finished my school in 1982. I did two years of my 11th and 12th, which is also called as A-level. Then joined the medical college in 1984. Took a transfer in 1987, and I came back to Bombay. And my father, alhamdulillah, He was a medical doctor. His name, Dr. Abdul Karim Muhammad Naik. Rahimullah. May Allah have mercy on him. And me at in Jannah. He was a medical doctor, passed his MBBS, and he was a psychiatrist. A doctor, you know, say of the mental people, psychiatrist. At that time, very few psychiatrists were there. He was the first Muslim president of the Indian Psychiatric Association, first Muslim psychiatrist. My father came from a very poor background, a humble background. There were 14 siblings, seven brothers and seven sisters. And he was the only graduate in his family. Then he became a doctor, he became a postgraduate. He was born in Ratnagiri a city in the Kokan region, Maharashtra. And Alhamdulillah, he became one of the most prominent Kokni Muslims of his time. My father, he was so poor, he didn't have money to pay for his school fees or his medical college fees. So what he did, he distributed milk in the morning. He distributed newspaper to earn a few rupees and gather it and pay the fees. And my father was proud. He said, you should never be shy as long as the work you do is honest and it is not un-Islamic. And even I'm not shy to say that my father was a milkman or was a newspaper vendor. I'm proud of it. Alhamdulillah, after he passed his medical studies, he had a flourishing business, so much so that Allah blessed him with a lot of niyama of this world. But when my father, when he started earning, he saw to it, he spent a large portion of his income for the poor, the destitute, and the widows. I don't know any needy person who has approached my father and my father did not help him. My father taught us, never be extravagant on yourself, never. But spend on education, no problem. He taught us that invest by helping the poor and the needy. My father used to say, I would never give anyone money to watch a movie, but if you want to buy books, I can give you 10 times more, 100 times more. He loved traveling. He went to several countries. He visited most of the major countries in the world, attending conferences, seminars, whether religious, whether it be medical. My father, alhamdulillah, was a philanthropist. He was very well known for his social activities, for his educational activities, for the religious institutions. He was the president, the chairman of umpteen numbers of educational institutions, of social institutions, of religious institutions. I can only give a talk on my father's background for a few hours. I don't intend doing that. But in short, 
he was very well known so much so that wherever i went they used to say there is the son of dr abdul karim naik but alhamdulillah wherever when i started traveling in the world almost all the countries that i traveled someone or the other knew my father either he helped them for the scholarship fees or gave them hostel facilities or gave them medical aid and alhamdulillah that really pleased us when we traveled throughout the world this was in brief about my father my father also had a passion of meeting religious personalities and even social and political personalities he knew most of the religious islamic figures in india and also some abroad one of his friends by the name of dr ali mate from cape town he used to send him video cassettes of sheikh ahmed didad and when i came back to bombay in 1987 we come back to 1987 i hardly saw about one or two cassettes of sheikh didad maybe half three fourth in december 1987 Sheikh Ahmed Didad happens to come to Bombay and my father tells me Sheikh Ahmed Didad is staying with my friend why don't you accompany me we'll go and meet him I wasn't really enthusiastic to meet him but because my father requested to keep my father happy I went so me and my brother we accompanied my father to meet Sheikh Ahmed Didad I did not know much about him I had seen uh, maybe half of his video one uh, when i went when we entered the house of my father's friend we could see that towering personality 6 foot 3 feet sheikh ahmed didad with a white beard impressive and he told us that i have come to india for a few days i had been to tatkeshwar surat the place where sheikh ahmed didad was born and you may be knowing that at the age of 6 he went to south africa and that's another long story we won't touch that So he came to visit his hometown the place of birth for a few days and he was returning back to South Africa. And he said tomorrow we went to meet him in the late evening or early night. And he told me tomorrow late night I am flying back to South Africa. So my father told him why don't you give a lecture tomorrow? So Sheikh Didad said how can you arrange a lecture in less than 24 hours? we can start the lecture after maghrib and your flight is late in the night he said how can you arrange my father said inshallah we'll do it imagine at that time in 1987 there was no social media there was no mobile if you had to do publicity you had to give an ad in the newspaper that was a few days before late in the night you cannot give ads for tomorrow but sheikh didad he agreed he said okay i'm free i don't mind arrange a lecture so my father my brother and myself i was only 22 years old that time and my father because he was involved as in many institutions for him to get a auto name was very easy he booked the alma latifi hall in sabu siddiq in bombay which had a capacity of 800 seats but i was wondering how could we fill 800 people overnight and alhamdulillah next day there were more than a thousand people there not only more than a thousand people the creme de la creme of the muslim community of bombay were there the rich businessmen were there the philanthropists were there the educationists were there the film stars were there only because of allah number 1 number 2 the popularity of didad and lastly because of the contacts of my father major my father did hundreds of phone call and convinced people to come to sheikh didad lecture and in less than 24 hours without any ad maximum we could do in the morning print some single color you know and stuck it on the walls of the muslim area But the major people that came were the personal contact of my father phoning each one and i was shocked 
to see the creme de la creme of the Muslim community of Bombay in large numbers. The hall had a capacity of 800, I think there were more than one and a half thousand people. It was packed. And Sheikh Dida told, I am only concerned about the audio. The audio sound system should be good. And he was impressed. He gave a talk on the topic Islam and other religions. And that's the first time I heard Sheikh Ahmad Didat's life. And that was the turning point in my life. In October 1987. And he was impressed that who are these two young boys who could organize in less than 24 hours and get more than a thousand people at that time. So we requested Sheikh Didat, why don't you come again after a few months? And he agreed to come again in the mid-1988. And that time he came for approximately 10 or 11 days. And we organized 18 lectures of his. And this time I was more aware of Sheikh Ahmed Didat. He had become my icon. He had become my hero. So when the second time Sheikh Didat came, and Alhamdulillah, we organized these talks in auditoriums. All of them were packed on different topics, 18 different topics. Two days they went to Bangalore. And I was the chauffeur. I was the driver, everything. And we could find the humility of Sheikh Ahmad Didat. He stayed in my house, in our house. He slept on the floor. And I told him, Uncle, why are you so aggressive? He told me, Son, I'm not aggressive, I'm militant. He said, I'm a Pathan. And there are only two ways you can fight the devil. One is with holy water, and the second is with fire. I chose the fire. He did not rebuke me. He told me, my son, I'm not aggressive, I'm militant. I'm a mujahid. And you can fight the devil with holy water or fire. I chose the fire. If somebody can fight with holy water, he's most welcome. I'm finding success in the fire, so I'm doing it. And that was the turning point in my life. Only on Sheikh Ahmed Didat I can speak for maybe 5 to 10 hours. Time will not permit us. Then when he went back, he invited me. I went to South Africa. I stayed at his home. Then he told me, why don't you attend the International Dawah Training Program to be held in the end of 1988? We have got thousands of applications. I think he had about 40 seats. But I was doing my medical college second year. I could not take a leave of two months. So I had to apologize. I came back to Bombay and my life changed. I started doing Dawa. I almost memorized all the lectures of Sheikh Tidat. Almost all. He had given me a set of more than 50 video cassettes. That time he had 50 sets. And I started my Dawa in Bombay. And I realized that when I spoke with non-Muslims, I never stammered. Miracle. When I did dawah with the non-Muslim, with the Christian missionaries, with the Hindu pundits, I never stammered. The moment I come back and speak with any Muslim, same stammering. Ajib. I said, what is this? The moment I start with the non-Muslim, no stammering. I come back home, I speak to my sister, I start stammering. I speak to my friends, I start stammering. I said, Alhamdulillah, at least while doing dawah, I don't stammer. And I started doing dawah, going to church, one-to-one -one dawah with priests, with pandits. And from 1988 to 91, Alhamdulillah, that became the major mission. So much so that I even did dawah in my Bombay Medical College, Nair Hospital, Topiwala National Medical College. And the Muslims were very few, hardly about 
In population, we are 14.5 percent, according to statistics, actually more than 20 percent. But in the medical college, we were only 3 percent. So when I asked to do dawa, all my Muslim friends used to run away, saying, Zakir will be marwaying. Zakir will now have us killed. So when I asked to start doing dawa with the Hindus, my Muslim friends used to run away. So I asked to be alone in the battlefield. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Never ever did any non Muslim even catch my collar. While I did dawa, till today, mashallah. I even started doing dawa with my professors and my teachers. So my Muslim friend used to say that in a medical college there is a separate examination called as viva vos, which is orals. So besides passing in theory, you also have to pass in orals, viva vos. So my friend said, "You are doing dawa with your professors; they will fail you." And to fail in Viva is very easy, there is no record. At least written paper, you can do re-examination and you can repass, correct? But Viva was, there is no re-examination. And you have to pass separately 50% in Viva and 50% in written exams. So my friend used to tell me that you're doing dawah with your professors, Hindu professors, they'll fail you. I used to tell them, if they fail me, maybe Allah wants me to do one, one more year dawah with them. I was an optimist. I never said, oh, if they fail me, why should I? I said, if Allah wants me to do, if Allah fails me, maybe Allah wants me to do one more dawah with them. And alhamdulillah, I continued my dawah. And we used to print, because my father had many organizations. So alhamdulillah, my father funded the complete tour of Sheikh Ahmad Didan. That was on his own. Allah had given him the capacity. So I told my father, why don't we print Sheikh Ahmadi that book and distribute it free? So we printed, he had about 17 books, some 10,000, some 15,000, 20,000 capacity. And we gave ads in the newspaper and started distributing Sheikh Didat's book free. Then we thought, why don't we make a library for distributing Sheikh Didat's video cassettes? to the public. And I told my father, why don't you give me some space? We have got so much property. So he gave me a small office of 250 square feet, less than 25 meters. And I told him, I require 5,000 rupees every month from you. You are donating so much outside. Why don't you give me 25,000? Why don't you give me 5,000 rupees a month? In today's, it would be about 67 US dollars. At that time, today the dollar rate is 75 rupees to a dollar. That time it was 23 rupees. So at that time, it was about 218 US dollars a month. I told my father, you are spending so much money giving charity. Why don't you give me 5,000 rupees, 218 dollars? That is less than a thousand ringgit to me. Nowadays it will be maybe less than 300 ringgit, that time it was 1000 ringgit. And my father told me, you want to start a religious organization? People will pull your leg, will pull you down. But you want to go ahead? You want to try? I will support you. So he agreed with that. So we started a new organization. And what name should we give? We had the option of giving the same name as the organization of Sheikh Ahmed Didad, Islamic Propagation Center International. But we thought giving the name propagation in a Hindu majority country will not be hikmah. So we chose the name Islamic Research Foundation. And we started the organization in a small place of less than 25 square meter with a budget of 5,000 rupees. In today's time, $67 at that time $218 a month. It was maybe one of the smallest organizations. And we started it. And what we did initially, I had one friend of mine who was also a medical doctor in the Unani field, Dr. Shweb Sayyid. He was quite popular in speaking amongst the Christian missionaries. So I thought, okay, he's the orator. We will create a platform for other people to speak. Because I was a stammerer. How could I speak? 
I couldn't have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. So what we used to do, we used to call students from engineering college and other colleges in groups of 25, 30, and we used to show them clippings of different speakers from the world. And I had a hobby of collecting all video cassettes of Islamic speakers, maybe for about half an hour to one hour. And then we had open question answer session. So the first program we had in the office, when we showed the video cassette, I told my friend, Dr. Shoeb, you are a speaker, go and handle the question answer session. He went the first time he got cold feet. What to do? People are waiting. I took the courage and I went. I took his place. And I realized that on the stage, I don't stammer. It was a miracle. On the stage when I started speaking, I did not stammer. When I came down from the stage, again I am stammering. Normally, the best of speakers when they come on the stage, they stammer. So to stammer is common on the stage, but me, being an extreme stammerer, on the stage I never stammered. And that's how I first time appeared in public in front of 25 people handling the question answer session and I realized that it clicked. They asked me question answer answer and I was very good in debating and arguing. In the school and college days, I was known for my logic and for argumentative skill. So much so that if they said proof black to be white, I could prove black to be white. I could prove day to be night. I was expert in arguing. Now, I'm using this skill to present Islam, to present the Haq. This was a change in my life. And I had a hobby and a passion to meet the various Islamic speakers of the world. And if I only talk on that, it will be tens of hours. I'll just speak about the experience of the second speaker or second personality who had a great impact on my life. And that was Dr. Israr Ahmed. Dr. Israr Ahmed, may Allah grant him Jannah. He was one of the best Urdu speaking orators in the world that I know of. So I traveled all the way to Pakistan in 1991 to meet Dr. Israr Ahmed. He was a medical doctor. He wasn't trained in any Islamic institute or Islamic University. He was a medical doctor inspired by Maududi, Jamaat Islami, went to Tabli Jamaat, then started his own organization, Tanjibul Islam. I went to Lahore to meet him. And I was shocked at his simplicity. The command that he has over the Quran, he also speaks in English but mainly in Urdu. And I was impressed by it. So, I purchased all his video cassettes and added to the video cassette library. And to cut the story short, I learned many things from him. I'll just mention two important things I learned. Number one, he told me that I told about my background, I'm a medical doctor, I've just passed. And in 1991, I finished my medical studies and I was doing my internship when we started the organization. In 1991, in 1990, I finished my medical studies. For one year, there was internship. And during internship, I had more time, so we started the organization. So I told him, I've just finished my medical studies. I would like to, do, I would like to become a surgeon, do my MS, and I'm interested in Dawa. So he told me, son, you have to choose between the two. Either you choose your medical practice or Dawa. I, being a medical doctor, I practiced for seven years and tried to do both. I could not. If you want to specialize, choose between the two one thing. Then, after his guidance, I chose to become a Dai. The second thing I learned from him was, he told me that if you want to become a Dai, see to it that you make your personal needs the minimum. I said, why? He said, if you make your personal need the minimum, 
with the least amount of monthly requirement, you can speak the truth more easily. You won't have to depend on anyone. You won't have to depend on please someone who's paying your salary. See to it that your needs are the least. And I saw that he had such a big institution, but what a simple man, Dr. Israr Ahmed. May Allah grant him Jannah. And this thing that not to spend excessively was one of the cornerstone of my success. Just in case I forget, towards then I may tell you, but today I require only 2,000 ringgit a month for me and my wife to survive. Only 2,000 ringgit. Very comfortably. Very comfortably. Not for my DAO activity. DAO activity, though I have travel, fly, I pay my own money, that's different. That may be a large amount. But for my personal needs, 2,000 ringgit is sufficient. In Bombay, it was 40,000 rupees. Here is 2,000 ringgit, sufficient. Inshallah, time permits, I'll come to it later on. So these two things I learned from Sheikh Ahmad Didan. And when I came back, I told my parents, initially when we started the organization, Islam Research Foundation, I told my parents, I will only be giving two hours a week. Because once I finish my internship, when I join the MS surgery, I have to be the 24 by 6 or 6 and a half. Maybe I get half a day in a week free. So I spend some time with my family and two hours in this organization. But then I decided I will not do my post-graduation. I told my parents, I want to give two hours a day for dawah and the balance time for my medical practice. My father had a roaring practice. My elder brother, Dr. Muhammad Naik, also was a doctor. And my brother, he was a very good orator. So when Sheikh Ahmed Didat came, he was the MC because he was the secretary general of his medical college. Very good orator, not an Islamic speaker, but a general orator. So that's how Sheikh Didat was impressed. So, I told my parents, two hours dawah, remaining medical practice. After a couple of months, I said, 50% dawah, 50% medical practice. They said, no problem. Then I said, two hours medical practice, remaining dawah. They said, no problem. Then after a, maybe a year or so, I said, full-time dawah. They said, no problem. I was involved in the setting up of the diagnostic center, which was very lucrative. It was 50% partner, myself and my brother. My brother told me, don't worry about this. I will take care of it. You do your dawa, I will give you a 50% share. I said, I don't require 50%. He said, no, no, I will give you 50%. It is your thing. You do your dawa. So, inshallah, my brother, Dr. Muhammad, will get more sawab than me. He said, go ahead. So, in the initial stages of dawa, I had no problem whatsoever about funding. I asked my father to give me 5,000 rupees a month. It became 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 a month. I never asked any money. Nine, more than 95% of the funding of the dawa for the first several years was by my father. Never had any problems. And the first talk I gave was in 1992 in December and as you are aware Sheikh Ahmed Dida didn't carry notes sometimes he had carried some sips but generally without notes so the first talk I gave in my life was is the Quran God's word in the office small office could accommodate about 50 60 people and I memorized I wanted to give a one hour talk so I memorized first time in my life and I gave the talk the talk went on for approximately three hours. I was inexperienced. Without notes, I spoke for three hours talking about the scientific miracles, about various research I did. Is the Quran God's word? It was little less than three hours. A marathon lecture, I thought it would be one hour. That was the first lecture of my life. It was in 
you know, just audience of 50 people. And then it started. Then we started having in public halls. For a few hundred, then a few thousand, then the numbers kept on increasing. And I had that philosophy at that time that a person should get married at the age of 25, best age, latest 27. So at the age of 25, I started finding a life partner. I could not find any. My only two criteria was she should be a Dai and she should know English. I wasn't interested in beauty, wasn't interested in wealth, wasn't interested in nobility, only virtue. She should be virtuous, a Dai, and knows English. So in the whole city of Bombay, I could not find anyone. Then one of the family friends told me that there is a girl in Pune, which is the city 160 kilometers from Bombay. So me, my mother and my wife, without telling that girl, without telling her, we just visited the house, you know, without telling her to try and find out what is she. And we went there and the mother welcomed and, and we were not knowing why we came there. We started asking about the love activities. At that time, I thought I was doing something wrong. Hidingly going to see a girl, I thought it was wrong. I thought it was a minor sin. But now we realize that a prophet said it's a sunnah to go and look at the girl they're going to marry. And there were sahabas who saw the girl they're going to marry hidingly. So it's permitted in Islam. That time I thought it was, you know, Maybe wrong, it's unethical. And mashallah, when we came to know about her, I was impressed. Never ever did I see any girl. This is the first girl because my sister used to first do the interview. We don't want to unnecessarily meet girls to marry. This is the first girl I met and I was impressed. And she did not know about it. So therefore I joke with my wife that, you know, I started loving you before you started loving me. And I tell her that I'm ahead of you in love. In other things, okay, in taqwa, in Islam, she may be higher than me. But as far as love is concerned, I love you more than what you love me. She says, no, she loves me more than me. So I said, we will do the Hisab Kitab in Akhirah, inshallah. So, mashallah, my wife... She was the president of the Girls Islamic Organization of Pune. And she used to give talks in Urdu. She was fluent in English. She was a lecturer in the college. And I said, yes, this is the girl I want. Virtuous, mashallah, taqwa. And we got married. People told, okay, now that you got married, now you'll give less time for dawah. Previously, I used to give about nine hours a day, ten hours a day. When I got married, I started giving 12 to 13 hours. When diagram. She came, we started a ladies' organization. First, Islamic Research Foundation didn't have a ladies' wing. I got married on the 16th of May, 1993. A very simple marriage <coughs> in a mosque. At that time, it was well known that people gave big receptions. And my father being well off and very well known, I made it a point and my wife too wanted a very simple nikah. So we only had a nikah in a mosque and we only gave dates that also dried dates it was a very simple marriage because the beloved prophet said make nikah simple so that zina would become difficult and the best marriage is that in which the least expense is made so we had a very simple nikah and mashallah there were more than 2000 people for my nikah not because of me, because of my father. The only thing we spent was, you know, sending invitations. And mashallah, more than 2,000 in a mosque, it was unheard of. For a nikah, unheard. In 1993. And then we had a walima. Very simple. We only called 19 people, direct brothers, sisters of mine, and brothers, sisters, and their spouses from my wife's side. Only 19 people. And we called 50 people from the orphanage. But the Prophet said, in the Walima, there should be poor people. So 50 people from the orphanage, 19 relatives of me and my wife, we hardly spend 
3,000 rupees on the Valima. That's it. 3,000 rupees would be 1,800 ringgit. So to give an example, and when my wife's relatives came, we, we kept them in my relative's home. We put beddings on the floor. We could have booked the best of five-star hotels. We could afford it. But we wanted to make the marriage very simple. So much so that we saved the money, what we can spend on the marriage, and we bought a new office for the organization. And that was the foundation. And it grew, mashallah. So what we could spend millions of ringgit on the wedding, which normally is done, compared to the status that we had, we spend that money in buying an office. I said, I don't want a house for myself. I want office for the DAO organization. And that was an investment. And this organization, Islamic Research Foundation, it grew. MashaAllah. And we'll come to it later on. Then, MashaAllah, on the 10th of July, about one year, two and a half months later, after the marriage, on 10th of July, 1996, my son, Farik, was born. And we asked an Arabic scholar, I want a name which is like a Dai, unique name, so he gave the name Farik. Farik means to differ between Haq and Batil, the truth again falsehood. A unique name, same like Farooq. And after Farik was born, he was hardly two and a half months, and we went to meet Sheikh Ahmad Didad. In 1994, we went to meet Sheikh Ahmad Didad. And Farik was two and a half months old, and you could have, we have the photograph of Sheikh Didad carrying my son, Farik. And he blessed him. And we can see the results of his dua. At that time, I gave my first lecture abroad in South Africa in the Grey Street Durban Mosque. It, is, it was the largest mosque of South Africa. And the person sitting in front of me was Sheikh Ahmad Didad. And I was nervous that Sheikh Ahmad Didad listening to my talk. And after that talk, he gave me a certificate calling me Didat Plus in 1994. And I said, surely this man is great. He wants to encourage me. Therefore, he called me. Oh, I was nothing. And then I asked his son, that has your father given this title to anyone else? He said, no, you're the only person. I thought maybe, you know, to encourage youngsters, people try and give. He said, no. I said, what did Sheikh Didat see in me? that he gave me this title. And in the Great Street Mosque, there were more than a thousand people there, maybe a few thousand people, mashallah, for the Juma Salah. And he told me, son, you are coming from India, you have large audiences, when you go to Saudi Arabia, Gulf countries, expect only five or ten people. Maybe in the mosque, maybe in the university, don't expect hundreds and thousands of people like you have in India. So I expect only five people, ten people, and then slowly, slowly, inshallah, later on you may get popularity. So when I went to give my first talk after Durban in 1996, in the beginning of 1996, the first talk I gave in Jeddah, I was expecting about 10 to 15 people. And mashallah, for the first talk in Jeddah, there were more than a thousand people. I was shocked. Then I realized some people had copied my video cassette and they distributed it. I had hardly given three, four lectures. It became viral. And Saudi Arabia is the hub. People from all over the world come to work there. From USA, from Canada, from UK, from Malaysia, you have from Australia. All over the world people come and work there. So from there, it became viral throughout the world. And I started receiving invitations from throughout the world. That was how I started my international talks. And in 1996, while I was doing my Hajj with my wife, 
we were supposed to go to Masjid Aqsa after Hajj. I received the information that Sheikh Ahmed Didat, Rahimullah, may Allah grant him Jannah, Jannah Fidos, he received a stroke and he was paralyzed. I immediately cancelled my trip. I told my wife, go back to Bombay. I went to the South African embassy, stamped a visa, and I was the first person from abroad to visit Sheikh Ahmed Didat when he got the stroke and he was hospitalized. Then his son requested me, his name is Yusuf Didat, that my father is supposed to give a series of talk in Cape Town. Can you replace him? I said, ah, how can I give in place of your father? He said, no, the program is organized, people will come. And I went to Cape Town and I gave the talks on behalf of Sheikh Ahmed Didat in 1996. And then later on, I kept visiting him a few times. And I remember in 2020 when I went, and Sheikh Ahmed Dida's favorite pastime after he got the stroke was watching my video cassettes. So when I went to meet him again in 2020, when he saw me, he tried to cry, and we used to communicate via the eyes. You know, because the person who's in coma who cannot move around, who had hemiplegia, there's a method of communication, there's a chart. Line number one, A, B, C, D, E. Line number two, F, G, H, I, J. Line number three, it goes on. So if you want to communicate, if he has to say I, one, two, he blinks. So second line, F, G, H, I, blink. So every letter you can spell by blinking your eye. So I was communicating with me, he said, I want to give you a message. And he gave that message to me. And that message, it took time. And his son was there. He said, son, my son, what you have achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve, alhamdulillah. And then his son took a plaque and he printed this with his thumbprint in 2020 May. Son, what you have achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve, alhamdulillah. And that was the biggest award that I got in my life. Sheikh Ahmed Didad himself, when he was sick, he gave that award to me. He, he blinked with the blinking of his eyes, he communicated with the thumb impression. Son, what you achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve. And this was because, if you remember, I had asked him, Uncle, why are you so aggressive? He said, I'm militant. You can fight the devil in two ways, with holy water or with fire. And when I met Sheikh Didat in the initial part of my dawah, I was multiple times more aggressive, multiple times more militant than Sheikh Didat. Because young blood, now also I'm young, mashallah. But that time I was younger. And I did dawah with my students, with my classmates, with my teachers. I got results, but I wasn't happy with it. I said, same matter of Sheikh Didat. Sheikh Didat is X amount militant, I'm 10X. Why results so less? Then I changed. Then I became soft. But when I became soft, they knew, oh, this is a lion. A lion need not roar. The king of the jungle need not roar. So I had a mixture. I could be more militant than Didat. I could be as soft as Sheikh M, like, uh, like Dr. Jamal Badwi. You know, so I, I had a different style, being humble, when required in debate, be militant. So I gave him one of my lectures on similarities between Islam and Hinduism. And there, you know, some of the Hindus who are belonging to some hardcore fanatic organization, they come and attack you. They're cursing me and I'm smiling. I'm saying, dear brother, and... Sheikh Dida said, my son, how can you smile when they're cursing you? So I told him, you fought the devil with fire, I'm fighting with holy water. At that time, he gave me this plaque. Son, what you have achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve. So then I developed a style. 
you should be as militant as Sheikh Didat, more militant, be soft, be humble, be logical. So I saw many speakers all over the world. Time will not permit me to speak about them. Variety of speakers. We had the largest video cassette library in the world at that time. About four or five thousand. And I used to see various speakers, logic, reason, did my own study. It was a variety. And Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Didad was the person who changed me from a doctor of a body to doctor of a soul. And Dr. Isar Ahmed inspired me to leave my profession. So these two people were the main people who were the inspiration. And in the end of 1996, on the 4th of November 1996, my second child, my eldest daughter, Zikra, she was born. And after she was born, next month, it was my first talk because in Bombay, the auditorium was limited. The biggest auditorium in Bombay had 3,000 capacity. So the audience started increasing. We hired a hall of 2,000, 4,000 people came sitting outside. So then we decided from now onwards, we will not have lectures in the hall. We will have in open grounds. So it was the first lecture of mine in the open ground in the same institute which Sheikh Didat gave. Sheikh Didat gave in the auditorium in Sabu Siddiq. I gave in the Sabu Siddiq ground. And we had put 6,000 seats. And mashallah, it was packed. So the first public lecture in open ground was in December 1996. And I remember from there, I went to Singapore and then I came to Malaysia. The first time I came to Malaysia on the invitation, I think the name of the person was Iskandar, Abdullah Iskandar. He called me. And we started receiving invitations from different parts of the world. And I said, let's travel. So I did not know this person. I came here. And then I gave talk in Abim. I went here. I went to Kuala Lumpur and different parts. I think it was in Penang. And that was my first trip to Malaysia. And I was impressed with Malaysia. Then I came back in 1998. Then 2000, 2001, 2004. And I kept on coming regularly. We'll come to it later on. Now when Sheikh Ahmed Didar got the stroke, he continued doing his dawah from the bed, but I had seen all his videos, and most of it I memorized. Now what to do? Then I started doing an introspection of myself. And I realized that I have got three major drawbacks. Number one, I have not gone to any Islamic university. No Islamic school, no Islamic college, no Islamic university, but I'm giving talks. Thousands are coming, ten thousands are coming. I don't know Arabic as a language, number two. I'm not Hafizul Quran. Many people think I'm Hafizul Quran, I'm not. So I decided that inshallah, all my children, I will see to it that they pass from an Islamic international university. I'll see to it that they learn Arabic Loga Fusa as a language. I'll see to it that all are Hafizul Quran. That was my aim. And I said, okay, fine. I should learn Arabic as a language. Now I'm already, no, I cannot go back to institute now. So I went to Makkah and one of the Loga department teacher, Moran Nadwi, I spent one month with him, learned a little bit. Then I said, I want to learn under the best teacher in the world. Then when I did my research, I came to know the best teacher to teach Arabic to a non-Arab was Dr. Fa Abdurrahim, who was the head of the Loga department of Islam University of Medina. I did not know him. So in 1997, I went to meet him. People told, impossible. He's so popular. He doesn't, he teaches PhD student. Why will he give you time? Head of the department of Medina University. I said, what's the humming trying? So, I took an appointment and I went to meet him. And I said, you know, I'm so and so person, I'm inspired by this, I'm listening, listening. He said, people told me you are the best teacher. So, can you give some time, is it possible? So he smiled. He said, Dr. Zakir, do you know he gave a lecture in Medina 
a few months back. I said, yes. I was sitting on the first row. I said, really? I did not know. And I'm impressed with your talk. What do you want? I said, I want you to give me a few hours a day. And I want you to tell me how much time will I take. He said, according to me, you give me five months, I will give you five hours a day. Five hours a day, one to one. I was like, Hadam in Fazir Rabbi, the best teacher in the world. The best scholar. And when I sat with him, he was an ocean of knowledge. He knew more than 17, 18 languages. German and so I went to Medina and I said I will stay there for five, six months. And immediately after Dohar, after lunch, up to Maghrib time. It was about five and a half hours, minus the time of Asar time in between half an hour. Five hours every day. But I had my nature of asking questions. So more than learning, I had to ask him questions. And because in my field of Dawa, I had been to so many anti-Islamic sites. There are grammatical errors in the Quran. And this person was a true scholar. Originally Indian, from Chennai. Then did his master's or PhD in al -Azhar. Then started the Loga department in Medina University. And his knowledge was par excellence. I learned many things from him. So instead of learning Arabic, I was more interested, you know, do this, do that. What is this? You know, oh, that, you know, this person, 30 grammatical errors. And he used to tell me how to answer. I thought, okay, six months are there. Let me finish in the first two, three weeks about my question. Then there is time for me. He had three books. Book one, book two, book three. I learned a lot. And from him I learned. He used to tell me that I am a Muslim. I am not Hanafi. I am not Shafi. I am not Hanbali. I am not Maliki. I am not Salafi. I am a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, Qala inna ni minal Muslimin. And that stuck to my mind. He told Allah never says in the Quran, you are a Hanafi, you are a Shafi, you are a Hanbali, you are a Maliki, you are a Salafi. And he used to laugh. And the command he had. He was my first official teacher. There were other teachers of Deen. And whatever I learned from him became as though I wouldn't have gained even if I had done PhD. Because that became my weapon. That became, you know, power for me. Because when I spoke with other scholars, when I gave, they didn't know. They were scholars of tafsir, of hadith, but they didn't know Luga. I spoke with Arabs, they did not know the answer. And what he told me, being original Indian, because he was an expert. Allah says in the Quran, Fas'alu ahli zikri in guntul atalamun. If you don't know, ask the person who knows. Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 7. So he was an ocean of wealth. Then I met my second great teacher, that is Sheikh Dr. Ziaraman Azmi, who was also an Indian. Dr. Fab Dream used to stay with him on the ground floor, he used to stay on the first floor. And being an Indian, even he knew me. So I told Sheikh Ziaraman Azmi, he was the head of the Medina University, dean of the Arabic, uh, dean of the Hadith department. Now to speak on Fab Dream, I can speak for two hours. To speak about Sheikh Ziaraman Azmi, he was a scholar of Hadith. I can speak for us together. To cut it short, he agreed to give me four hours twice a week. And my basic of Hadith was with Dr. Ziyadman Asmi. He was Hindu, he was a Brahmin, became Dean, and then he compiled the Jame Kamil. Jame Kamil is one of the unique work, all the Sai Hadith are together. I can speak an hour on Jame Kamil, just to cut it short. There is no compilation of all the hadith together. Sahih Bukhari, Sahih, but all hadith aren't there. What he did, because I asked to question him. Doctor, we talk about Quran hadith. Where is the hadith? Okay. Almani did Sahih Bukhari Muslim, Sahih Abu Dawood, Sahih Nasai, Sahih Tirmidhi, but all the hadith are not there. He said yes. So he couldn't answer to me. But after he retired, his mission became to compile all the Sahih Hadith. And, mashallah, 
all my support and duas were there. And he was able to complete in about 18 to 20 years. He compiled all the Sahih Hadith and removed the duplicate, 16,546 Hadith. Then we have a summarized version. We are doing the translation. Inshallah, the English version would be completed in a couple of months and the print would be out by the end of this year. Time doesn't permit me to speak about that, but my basic of hadith knowledge came from Dr. Zayra Manasmi. Unfortunately, after about three and a half weeks, less than a month, I got a call from Bombay that I had to go back to Bombay immediately. So that I could not complete my, my Arabic language course. Did finish two books with him, but the third book was the voluminous. I went back and then got involved in other activities. So these two were the initial two teachers in my life. And after that, I met Alhamdulillah. As my passion was to meet the top scholars of the world. And to cut it short, I met Sheikh bin Baz, Raimullah, in the year 1998. At that time, the three top scholars at that time, Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh Nasr al-Albani, and Sheikh Otaimi. So my passion, I met Sheikh bin Baz, I couldn't meet then his secretary, Sheikh Lukman Salfi. He knew me, then introduced me. We had a one-to-one -one meeting for us together. And his advice is, mashallah, time would permit me. And Sheikh bin Baz expired on the 13th of May, 1999. Maybe a few months or a year after I met him. And Sheikh Nasrud Albani, he expired on the 2nd of October, 1999, the same year, after a few months. I said, oh, two great scholars gone together. Now the third one remaining is Sheikh Otaimi. So I have to go to Saudi Arabia in a year, twice or thrice. Average three times, sometimes four times, five times, I had a Akama. Right from 1997, for more than 20 years, 21 years I had a Akama. So in, in, in the year 99, I wanted to meet Sheikh Hussaini. He was not in town. In 2020, in, in the year 2000, in 1999, a lot of time in the year 2000, I went. He was sick in the hospital. And unfortunately, in January 2001, on the 10th of January, Sheikh Hussaini, may Allah grant him Jannah, even he expired. It was my bad luck, I could not meet him. The next best scholar of that time living was Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen. I thought I should not miss him. So I met Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen, great scholar, and from right from 2005, 6, 7, 8, multiple times I met him. He was a great source of knowledge. At that time, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen was one of the best living scholar. And if I had any difficulty, any fatwa, and I used to communicate with him to one of my friends, Sheikh Jaman Zahrani, who was a pilot, and he was a great guy, mashallah, and even now he's alive, so he was my main communication with all these scholars, and Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen gave a fatwa about Peace TV, I'll come to it later on, that Peace TV, you can use zakat money for jihad, and the best jihad is the jihad with the media. And he gave a fatwa that you can give zakat to Peace TV in 2006, I think seven. And every year we used to meet him a few times, mashallah, and spend a lot of time with him. And may Allah grant him Jannah, he expired in 2009, that July, Sheikh Abdul Jibreen. This is just to give you a brief time, it's running short. I had a passion of meeting scholars, whether it be Salafi, whether it be Hanafi, and the best Indian scholar at that time was Maulana Ali Mianadwi. He was the most renowned Islamic scholar of India, all over the world, including Gulf country. He was known for his books on literature. He was the person who was given the second award. The second person who got the King Faisal Award after Maududi was Maulana Ali Mianadwi. And he also got the first award of the Dubai Holy Quran International Award. He was the only Indian at that time to receive both these awards. There was no Indian who received both these awards. There was no Indian who received King Faisal Award. He was the only one. 
There was no Indian who received the Dubai Holy Quran Award, which was the second award. He was the only Indian. And he was well known. And he was close to my father. We met many times. We discussed. I learned a lot from him. I met Maulana Abdul Karim Parekh. He was another Hanafi Maulana. And I was the closest to him, very close to him. And had a lot of experience. Then the other person I remember was Qadi Mujahidul Islam. MashaAllah. Excellent in mantik, in logic. You're the judge. You're the jurist. MashaAllah. Qadi Mujahidul Kasmi. These are great names from India. Then I met Salim Kasmi, who was head of Deoband. So in, because I did not go to any particular madrasa, my mind was in, you know, blocked. I met Hanafi scholars, Deobandi, Nadwi, Salafi, and I was broad-minded, mashallah. And I used to meet any scholar, but mashallah, the main guideline was Quran and Sunnah. Time is running short. Then, in the year 1999, on the 26th of February, my third child was born, my second daughter, that is Rushda. And I told my wife that our beloved prophet said, if you bring two daughters with love and affection till they mature, inshallah, you will be in Jannah close to the prophet. So I said, good. After Rushda was born, inshallah, maybe they will be a Jannah. And all these names that you find, Zikra was again given by another Arabic scholar. Rushda was given by Dr. Fahab Darim. I said, I want a name which is a Dai name, a unique name, a name for Dawa. So Farik is Farq between Haq and Batil. Zikra is same like Zakir, a lady who does Zikr. Rushda is one who gives guidance. And Alhamdulillah, all these words had an impact on my children. And mashallah, we started a school. My son was admitted in the same school where I was, St. Peter's High School, a Christian missionary school. But we wanted to, it was my desire to make an institution which is education for both the worlds. And we started the Islamic International School. And whoever I met, they said it is impossible. How can you have Deen and Dunya together in the same school? Impossible. And I met many scholars. All of them, 100%. They said, not possible, except for Dr. Fahab Darim. Dr. Fahab Darim said, it is very difficult, but it's possible. And we started the Islamic International School. I've given the talk of about three and a half hours on that. Time will not permit me to speak about it. Our main basic was, when a person passes from that school, he should be better than an average person passing from Madrasa, who's an alim. And... He should be better than a person who does his A-level from Cambridge. So we had a school recognized, you know, a school with the, the certificate came from Cambridge A-level, recognized, it's the most recognized system in the world. And we taught Arabic from the age of nursery, three years, two and a half years. And we had graduates from Medina University teaching, they said, Zakir, how can we teach Arabic? I said, if Allah helps you, can you do it or not? So my, my key, my master key was, if Allah is with you, can you do it or not? And that way, mashallah, we started, we taught Arabic from the age of three. We did hifz of the Quran. One third of the people were hafiz. They could quote Quran, chapter number, verse number. We had fiqh, hadith in English and Arabic. And my intention was that 50 persons who passed from the school, they would go in the mainstream, become doctors, engineers, lawyers, you know, but Muslim, Muslim practicing lawyers. Engineers, doctors, and 50% dais, teachers, etc. The first batch of students, there were about 14 boys and girls, I don't remember. From 14 boys, half of them went to the mainstream, seven of them, we got them admitted to Imam Muhammad, Imam Muhammad University, Imam Muhammad bin Saud University. And according to me, the best Islamic university in the world, according to me, you know, the more famous is the Medina University. Islamic University in Medina, but according to me, because Islamic University in Medina, 50% of the students are foreigners, 50% are Saudi. Imam Muhammad bin Saud, less than 1% are foreigners. So non-Saudi can't get admission, very difficult. But Alhamdulillah, Allah's help was there. I approached the dean, he knew me. He gave admission to all seven without examination, all seven. 
So all seven students, mashallah, went. And my son, mashallah, last year, in December, sorry, year before last, in 2020, December, he passed from Imam Muhammad bin Saud from the Sharia field, mashallah. And now he's doing his master's in the IIUM. I said that, you know, graduation is fine, but main is practical dawah. If with me, maybe he will know more dawah than. So I told him not to continue in Saudi. Now he's taking admission into Islam University of Medina, sorry, Islam University of Malaysia, IIUM, and he's doing his master's in fiqh and usul fiqh. My daughters, they passed recently from the Princess Noura University. They finished the Bachelor's in Islamic Studies. All three of them are Mashal Hafizul Quran. But among the three, my youngest daughter, Rushda, she is phenomenal. Her hips is phenomenal. Anytime she can decide, one day she stood, she started from Fajr after Fajr. By Asara Maghrib, she finished the full Quran without any mistakes, Mashallah. So Allah has given her the power of his, Mashallah. And she stammers. Not like as much as me, but she does stammer. So each child of mine has their own speciality. Farik is more well versed with giving public lectures. Zikra is good with the Qirat. She has more passion and love. So all three of them have their own qualities. All three of them, they, they know Luka Fusa very well. They have Hafizul Quran. All of them are bachelors from Islamic University. All of them intend doing their masters and PhD, inshallah. So we started the school. And that was one of my projects of life. Then, my second project of life was to have an Islamic satellite channel. And we saw the other channels and we started Peach TV, mashallah. In January 2006, we launched Peach TV English in January 2006. Time is short, I'll just rush through. Urdu channel we launched in 2009. 2011, we launched the Peach TV Bangla and Peach TV Chinese Mandarin in 2015. Each one has a story, each channel I can speak for a few hours. Time will not permit me. Alhamdulillah, we became the largest religious network in the world, having a viewership of 200 million people, mashallah. 200 million viewers. We covered the full globe. In 2016, only Peach TV English had more than 100 million viewers. Peach TV Urdu had more than 80 million viewers. Peach TV Bangla had more than 50 million viewers. And Peach TV Chinese had more than 20 million viewers. And it was the first high-definition religious channel in the world, even earlier than the Christian missionary channels. In July 2009, we launched the first HD religious channel, and now all four HD, mashallah. I had a dream that we should have the best equipment in the world for Islam. And we did that. We had the best of cameras. People said, this person is rough. I said, this you know, Allah had blessed us. I can own even Rolls Royce, but my Rolls Royce was my camera. Each camera costing more than a million ringgit. One camera, more than a million ringgit. We had 18 cameras, mashallah. So this was my Rolls Royce. But in 2005, I changed my policy. I said, no, I don't want to have the best equipment for, for video broadcast, no. I said, I want to have the best equipment for film telecast. So in 2005, we went to Japan, we went to Sony, and we said, we want to buy cameras. 15, I said, crazy, 15 cameras, film cameras? I mean, where are you coming from? So Sony in Japan was shocked. Normally, film camera, film the shot with one camera. If there's a fight sequence, three camera, four camera. Why do you own 15 cameras? Maybe understand. Or, or do you have more money? I said, no, no, no. My logic is that if you shoot with the best, bro best video cameras today, it can be in the world for maximum four or five years. After four years, it will get obsolete. That's the reason Sheikh Didar used the best cameras. But what he shot in 2000, the last lecture he gave, 1996, in the year 2000, became obsolete. So when I want to telecast Sheikh Didar on my Peach TV, only to upgrade 200 hours, I spend more than a million dollars. And then I write on my channel, poor quality, sorry. Didad used the best cameras of his time. So in 2015, I changed my policy. I will not use the best ca cameras for video. I will use the best camera in the world for film and show it on video. 
I said, what is the logic? I said, the logic is, if I shoot a scholar, I can have his video telecast for next 50 years. Now, Sheikh Didad, I cannot show on PTV. I'm showing, but with poor quality. If, I, if we had used film cameras for Sheikh Didad, even today it would have been 8K. So we bought 4K cameras, 8K cameras, and it was on the Sony website. There is no production house in the world which owned the cameras which we owned. We believed in quality. And the cost was only a small percentage. Why? Because there's a cost for labor, there's a cost for telecast. The equipment cost is there, but if I divide it, I'm spending only 5% more, and I'm securing the footage for the next 50 years. Allah gave us, mashallah, success, and we kept on growing. The other thing that I had in mind and my desire was to have a conference. When I used to see Grammy Awards, Oscar Award, what technology they have got, lighting, cameras, but majority haram. So why can't we use this technology for halal means? I'm running short of time. <coughs> so why can't we use, because lighting is not haram, camera is not haram, most of the things done on the camera is haram, that's different. But camera per se is not haram, lighting is not haram. So when I, to, I said, why can't we Muslim use these good stages? So I said, let me, Ya Allah, I pray to Allah, let me at least do one conference with this good stage. So in 2007, what we did? I invested in some Islamic stocks and in one year I made more than a million dollar profit and then we had this conference the cost of the conference was of course four million dollars and we did this conference phenomenal with the best of cameras lighting stage and people were shocked we called 20 best English speaking duats from all over the world and including Sheikh Hussein, he was there. And you can ask him, most of the people who came from America, Yusuf Estes and all this, what is this? And when we showed them, it was all white cloth. What is this white, white? In the day, when they saw in the evening, it was lit up with multicolors, with the best, and they were shocked. And they gave interviews that never in our life we attended such a conference. And everything was free. It was telecast throughout the world. The software is yet there. Then we had the second conference in 2008 in Urdu, then the third conference in 2009 in English, then 2010, 2011. Every conference we had one Imam from Haram. In the first conference we had Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub, who was from Imam of Medina Mosque of Masjid Nabi. Second conference we had Sheikh Salah Budair, again from Masjid Nabi. Then we had Adil Kalbani, we had Sheikh Shuraim. Sheikh Sudesh was supposed to come, he couldn't come. Then Sheikh Shuraim came again the second time. And, again, I can speak for maybe 5-10 hours on the conferences. Allah blessed. It was a desire. We want to have it once. It became so good that when we showed people, they said, can we be part of it? Part of it means what? No, then we made a documentary. And the documentary became viral. So everyone started with, can we be, I said, everything is free. So because of this, mashallah, we started receiving support phenomenal. And as I said, we started small. We started giving lectures in a small hall of mine, then went outside, a few thousand. In three, four years, it became in Bombay, 6,000, then 10,000. Then the audience kept on increasing in Bombay. Then the audience in the conferences for my talk went up to 200,000. The largest gathering I gave was in Kishan Ganj in 2012, where there were more than a million people live. It was the largest gathering of any religious speaker in the world. It's a record, one million people live, and it is not, it is of a single speaker, and that's not hypothetical. It's not hypothetical, it was actual. And, Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed. Hazamin Fazir Imagine I could not have dreamt of speaking in front 
of 25 people in my dream. In my dream, I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world, but I couldn't have dreamt of becoming, speaking in front of 25 people. And here Allah makes it possible. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, in the full life of my dawah, we never charged a single penny for any of my dawah activity. In the first few years, it was mainly funded by my family. And we used to give a percentage, and Allah blessed. When I left my medical practice, I was yet 50% partner. I started doing my own business. I used to spend on average two days a month, a few hours a week, maybe less than 24 days a year, and used to earn millions of dollars. How I mean for Rabbi? Allah blessed. And whatever we used to earn, we used to see to it that we used to make Allah a bigger partner than us. So minimum we started initially was 51% of what we earned, we gave in charity. Then kept on increasing, I won't tell you, that's between me and Allah. But I tell people that if you want to make Allah your partner, make him the major shareholder, not the minor shareholder. If Allah is the shareholder of your business, who will take care of your business? Allah. I tell everyone, I tell my staff, what, even if you earn a thousand ringgit, start with 10% in the way of Allah. Allah will make it 2,000, then give 15%, then give 20%. The more you give, the balance with you, percentage will be less, but the amount will be more. And I'm the living example. We never use dawa even to earn a single penny, never ever. Even all the awards that we got, 100% what we got, we gave it for waqf. When Allah is giving us directly, why should we? Agreed, taking salary for dawah is not haram at all, it is jayas. Please don't get me wrong. But when Allah is giving you directly, why do you require to take a salary? We never had problems. The moment I kept on increasing the share of Allah, the balance with me kept on becoming more. But what I spent on myself was very less. I learned from Dr. Isar Ahmed. What you spend on yourself should be minimal. What you spend for dawah, do it. So whenever we traveled, it's a policy initially in the first few years. Yes, when organizers used to call us, they used to give us a ticket. I used to say only economy. After a few years, first condition, if I come to give talk, I will pay for my ticket. I will pay for my hotel. Till now, if you pay for my ticket, I will not come. Except if it's a government invitation, if I'm called by Saudi Arabia, you know, I cannot argue with the king. But if it's any prince calling me, you know, once the brother of Prince Ali bin Talal, he called me. I said, I'll come. Okay, we'll book a ticket for you. I said, sorry, you cannot. We'll book the best five total. I said, sorry, you cannot. If you want me to come, I pay for my ticket, I pay for my hotel. Allah is giving us directly, so why should you? Those who can't afford, they take the ticket. Okay, today, what do you have in the world? I will only come for the lecture if you give me a thousand US dollars. I'll only come for the lecture if you give two thousand dollars. What is this? Demanding money? As a salary, okay. But if you don't give money, you know, people offered me for one one lecture big amounts. I said, impossible. It's my condition that if you call me, you cannot charge any money unless it's a conference. My condition became, if you call me, you cannot charge money. If you have less money, I will pay you. So we never earned even a single penny. Even the tea that I had in my organization, being the president, I paid for that. It is allowed to have tea. But I didn't want Allah to say, okay, I have donated so much, now tea money is calculated. I could have said that. If we used any staff for any of my private work, I paid a salary. So many of my staff were paid by me personally because sometimes they used to work for me. I didn't want any of my sawab to be reduced. What people think, okay, you're doing dawah, Allah, Allah has blessed me a lot. Even if I'd been the best doctor, I wouldn't have won so much. Did investment in shares, did real estate, started a mobile, whatever we did, we got profit. I hardly spent less than two days in a month. And Allah blessed us. But the major shareholder of all my business is Allah. 
And Alhamdulillah, time is short. I'll just mention one more thing that we got listed in, in India in 2009. There was the 100 most powerful men of India by one of the leading newspapers, Indian Express. In 2009, they listed me as 82nd most powerful. I don't know how they came to know. In 2009, 82nd, and in the spiritual gurus, I was number three. In 2010, all over India, I became 89th most powerful. There was no Muslim religious person in this list any time. Yes, there were some Muslim actors, you know, Shah Rukh Khan, Salman Khan, but no Muslim religious personality. Hindu, yes, many. In 2010, in the spiritual gurus, it was Ramdev Baba, number one in 2009, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, two, I was third. In 2010, they became lower than me. I became first, so they didn't publish the list only. Allah blessed. In, in a Yugov research, they have the most, the person who's most popular. So in Pakistan in 2014, in the Yugov list, I was the sixth most revered person in Pakistan. There was Bill Gates, Barack Obama, and the Prime Minister was number seven, Nawaz Sharif. And in the 500 most influential people in the world, from 2011 till 2021, always, mashallah, in the most honorable. They give a list of 50 top people, then 10 people who missed the list, then 15 people who missed the list. So Alhamdulillah, from 2011 to 2021, for 11 years continuously, I was in the list of honorable mentions. Then in 2019, there was a list of all over the world, the 100 most people who collectively worked for 10 years, and they ranked me 79. I don't agree with this ranking. I don't agree with this ranking. It is hard, I mean, for the Rabbi. I don't agree that the person who was ranked first was first over the I'm 97. We did for sake of Allah. I just want to tell you that Allah gives you deen and dunya both. By being the best doctor in the world, I wouldn't have earned so much of fame. I didn't do it for fame. The reason I'm telling you is that our main niya was to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah made a stammerer into one of the best orators, alhamdulillah. Now, come to the second part. Time is short. Mahijra from India to Malaysia. This part is actually longer than the first part, but time is short. Alhamdulillah, till 2007, I started Dawa in 1988, started the organization in 1991, in February, IRF. In the span of 25 years, from 88 to 2007, that was 20 years initially, there was never any, any controversy about me. And I always had a philosophy that if you're doing something on the huck, there's bound to be obstacles. But for me, for the first 20 years, there was no obstacles. No controversy. Mashallah, in my following, Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki, all types of people, Muslims coming and non-Muslims coming and no problem at all whatsoever until when we had the first peace conference 2007. You know, when the banner became bigger. And a question was asked to me regarding Yazid. May Allah have mercy. And I said, may Allah have mercy on him. When I said that in the answer, I won't go to the details. May Allah have mercy on him. I said to Yazid, Conference went very fine. Few days later from Pakistan, the Shias of Pakistan, no, oh, how did he say it? Yazid, Rahimullah, may Allah have mercy. Big controversy. Before that, Shias used to call me to give talks because I was on comparative religion. That was the first controversy. I stuck and I gave references from all the scriptures and everything. Second controversy that happened, was in 2008 when we did the peace conference Urdu. When we called Urdu speakers from different groups, from different sects on same platform and they tried to stop the conference. 
And that was a time in my life when I thought the earth is taken away from my feet. Such a big conference, it will be stopped. It was a small problem that time, but that time I thought it was a big problem. What to do? I went to my cabin, prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next day, the home minister interferes. His son, being a Hindu, he comes and touches my feet. I said, this is not allowed. And the conference goes on, to cut the story short. Third controversy in 2010. In 2010, I had been to UK in 2009. And in UK, when I went in 2009, the head of the counterterrorism department, Charles Farr, he approached me and said, you are very popular. We want you to help us to reach those Muslims who we cannot reach. So I told him, I will help you in two conditions. Number one, you should not ask me to do anything against Quran and Sunnah. Number two, I don't want your money. He agreed. The UK government wanted my help to reach those Muslims who they could not reach because of the popularity of Peace TV. In 2010, the government changes. From Labour Party, you have the Conservatives. Because the new government comes, Theresa May, at that time she was the Home Secretary, later she became the Prime Minister. She didn't know me. She said, who is the most popular Muslim speaker in UK? They said, Zakir Nai, banned him. We cannot, he has not done anything wrong. Banned him. Find something in his speech which he spoke against UK. He hasn't spoken against UK. Find something in his speech which is illegal, nothing illegal. Okay, go to CIA, ask them. CIA said, we have nothing against Dr. Zakir Nai. I said, yet I want to ban him. He said, if you ban him, he will go to the court. She said, I will handle the judges. And she excluded me. The only country officially to exclude me in 2010 was Theresa May. Three weeks she came to power. She didn't know me, but because I was a popular Muslim, then I realized there are two problems, major problems in Dawa. Number one, amongst the Muslim, there are sects who fight against each other. Biggest problem. Number two, in the political arena, the politician non-Muslim, to get his vote bank, he will attack the Muslim dais. So these two are the major problems for Dawa. Number one is Muslims having sex among themselves. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 103, tafraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. If we Muslims are united, inshallah, no one can interfere with us. And I had a formula to unite the Muslims, but time is short. I cannot touch on that. So I was shocked. The head of the counterterrorism department wants my help, and now they want to ban me. So they ban me, and my lawyer say, oh, we'll fight the case. We'll win 99.9%. One of my fans, we have the best of lawyer. He tells me that we will have the best of lawyer, but we will not win. We will lose. We spent more than a million pounds only in fighting the government. We lost the case, but we won the battle. Our organization was safe. And we went to Supreme Court. We went to the European Court. That was the first experience of political interference. In 2012, one of my staff, he uploaded a video without checking on my Facebook, in which it was my speech, but altered. There was laughter in between. So it gave a wrong picture. That was towards the end of 2012. And I was supposed to come for a lecture tour to Malaysia. It was Ganesh Chaturthi, just maybe a month before that. And there was no problem in India, but some Hindus from Malaysia, they took that clip and made it viral and started complaining. And they told people in India, the first time any non-Muslim objected to my talk was in 2012. Why? In 2007, it was Muslim because from Pakistan, she has complained. In 2012, it was Hindus from Malaysia, some organization. They complained to Hindu organization in India, and there was big, massive protest, first time. The Hindus in India normally love me. They respect me. They revere me. Therefore, for my talk, 25% of the people coming for my talk are non-Muslims. So from 1988 to 2012, there was no problem at all. 25 years, no problem. But some political organization in India 
took that issue and made a show out of me and made police complaints. First problem in India regarding non-Muslim 2012. But Alhamdulillah, Allah helped us. We continued. Then in 2014, in India, the BJP government, you may be aware, it's an anti-Islamic party, it's a Hindu fanatic political party, they came to power. And when they came to power, the scenario in India changed slowly. And to cut the story short, in 2016, I was on my trip for Umrah in Mecca, and every year from the year 2002, 3 till for 15 years, every year, the last 11 days or 10 days, me and my family always spent in Mecca. Then after that, went to Medina for a week. We were in Mecca on the 1st of July, 2016. There was a bomb blast in Dhaka. And a newspaper by the name of Star said one of the terrorists, he was a fan of Dr. Zakir Naik on the Facebook. That came in the newspaper on the 3rd of July, 2016. 4th of July, next day, almost all the papers in, in India, Dr. Zakir Naik inspires, inspired the terrorist of Dhaka bombing. Three days later, that Bangladeshi newspaper corrected. We never said Dr. Zakir Naik inspired. We only said one of the terrorists was a fan of Dr. Zakir Naik. Out of 14 million people that time on my Facebook, if one person, so they said that we never said that newspaper corrected, but the Indian media did not. Then we realized it was a plan and plot of the, of the Indian government. But Alhamdulillah, because of the popularity by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there were protests all over India. So much so that in most of the cities of India, there were protests. And Alhamdulillah, all the Muslim sects, whether Hanafi, Shafi, Hamli, Maliki, Deobandi, all of them supported me, almost all. They said, we may not agree with Dr. Zakir Naik, but he's not a terrorist. There were big protests. So much so that in one month's time, in the parliament, the Indian government said, Dr. Zakir Naik, organization not involved with terrorism. In the parliament, they said. And all the protests died down. But it was the plan. When the protests died down, they made a new issue in November about the Muslim personal law. When all the Muslims got together, in between that, on the 17th of November 2016, the Indian government banned my organization. I was outside India. I wanted to come back do a press conference, they didn't allow me. So I was already outside India, not that I ran away from India. And they banned the organization for five years. At that time, because the Muslims were involved in the Muslim personal law issue, there was no protest, hardly any, and it was their planning. After that, mashallah, I never imagined the red carpet treatment I got from the other countries in the world. I got offers from about 12 to 15 countries. Come and stay here, come and stay here. We'll give you this, we'll give you that. I did my survey. Previously, I traveled as a lecturer, not knowing the ins and out. I took time and I found, according to me, the best country today, if a Muslim has to live, according to me, it is Malaysia. I can give a one-hour lecture why Malaysia is the best country, time doesn't permit me. And I said that. Number one, Malaysia is away from the war zone. You know, Gulf country, you know, war zone, Yemen, Syria, what is going on. Number two, it is not under the clutches of the Western power like America, etc. Number three, according to me, the best non-Arab country in the world, in which Muslims are the most practicing, according to me, is Malaysia. An average Muslim in Malaysia an average Muslim in Malaysia is a better practicing Muslim than an average Muslim of India or an average Muslim of Pakistan or an average Muslim of Bangladesh. And this is my own research. And I can give you proofs. Dr. Zakir Naik always proves with proof. On average, uh, um, if you see in, Malaysia, in India, how many people pray five times a day? How many? 
not less than 10 percent some services less than five percent how many people pay five times in a mosque less than two percent same in pakistan same in bangladesh in malaysia mashallah according to me more than 50 percent pay five times a day in a mosque more than 25 percent you go to the mall there are people praying in the mosque so as a practice in muslim except non-arab countries gulf is a different thing saudi arabia is a different thing the best non-arab practicing muslim country is malaysia point number three Point number four, point number four, the federal religion of this country, Malaysia, is Islam. Point number five, in most of the countries, in most of the states of Malaysia, where Raja is there, a Muslim can propagate to a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim can't propagate to a Muslim. Point number six, the government funds the mosques and the Islamic activities like Baitul Mal, there is Zakat. And you see, every mosque now, the new mosque coming to Gufran Mosque, the mosque is there, there's a basement. There is a place for the imam, there is a place, auditorium, you go to Kuala Mosque, beautiful. You don't find this in other parts of the world. Point number, point number seven, the country which has the best Islamic economic system, that, that, that interest fee banking, it's in Malaysia. In terms of quantity, Saudi Arabia is number one, but in terms of number, in terms of value of dollars, Saudi Arabia is number one. Malaysia is number two, Saudi Arabia 25%, Malaysia 17% of the economy. But in terms of banking system, the easy facility of riba fee banking, it is Malaysia number one. Every bank has, has an Islamic Sharia, an interest fee account. Alhamdulillah. There is takaful, there is insurance, and I can go on and go on. Time is short. Next point is, Malaysia is a beautiful country. The scenery, the tourism is excellent. You can go to different parts. And tomorrow I'll be trying to Langavi, mashallah. It was rated as one of the halal tourism. Alhamdulillah. In terms of living, the, the percentage, the expenditure in Malaysia, the standard of living is good. The expenditure is less as compared to the Gulf country. Malaysia, mashallah, is an economically strong country. Now, because of pandemic, most of the countries are down. That's a different thing. And the list is wrong. Time doesn't permit me. So I chose Malaysia. I never thought in my life before that ever I will have to leave India. I thought they will stop my... I never thought in my dream that they'll accuse me of terrorism. So they went to the Interpol in 2017 and they requested that Dr. Zakir Naik should have a red corner notice. Then we called a lawyer a very famous lawyer in UK, and he came to advise me. He said, if any country requests Interpol for terrorism charges, 99.9% .9 they will give it. So I said, why have you come here then? What I can do, I can delay the red corner notice. How long? Two, three months. A nonsense. But Alhamdulillah, when Indian government sent the request to Interpol, Interpol rejected it. Outright. In 2017, they requested. 2018, Interpol had a committee. Mashallah, maybe they saw my cassette. They said, no, Dr. Zakir Naik, there is no evidence he's a terrorist. There's no charge seat filed against him. There's no proof. So again, in 2018, Indian government requested the second time to Interpol, and they changed the charges from terrorism to hate speech. And they gave sample of my hate speech. Interpol again had a meeting in 2019, and they said, no, he does not give hate speech. Then 2000. 19, again they're fresh. Okay, Dr. Zakir, like now they've changed the charges to money laundering. Oh, he's collecting money, he'll be money laundering. What a beautiful reply Interpol gives in 2020, 21, 11 months ago. In February, they write, Dr. Zakir Naik, there's no proof at all he's doing money laundering. If he collects, he has a right, he's following the law of the country where he's collecting. Never do we collect illegally. And it was a slap on the Indian government. There is not a single court in the world which has put any verdict against me. In 2019, in 2018, sorry, when the, when the NIA and the ED, they attached my property, we went to the court. The head of the tribunal, Dr. Manmohan Singh, fortunately, he had seen my videos. He said, I have seen Dr. Zakir Naik's video. Give me one evidence, any one lecture of his, in context, 
where he supports terrorism, I will attach all his properties. Imagine a Sikh, a non-Muslim. He is saying, the judge is telling the lawyer, I have seen Dr. Zakir Naik's video cassettes. Show me any one lecture of his in context where he has promoted terrorism, I will attach all his property and there was a stay. So by law, by court of law, I have not been convicted at all. Yes, because I did not go back for the case, there are arrests falling against me, but not a single court has convicted me anywhere, nowhere in the world. And Indian government tried the level best with many countries to get me back, including Malaysia. Alhamdulillah, Malaysia has been strong. The government kept on changing. All the government supported me because they knew the truth. They supported the truth. That's the reason I said that Malaysia, mashallah, is strong country. And mashallah, they do not bend down to pressures of the international. Though the relationship of India and Malaysia is good, but alhamdulillah. And always, mashallah, always, I had no problem at all with as far as the government is concerned. Only problem I had is, as I told you, with the non-Muslim politicians. The non-Muslim politician of India, now they started me using as a vote bank. The Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, in his next election in 2019, in less than two minutes, he takes my name seven times. Imagine the Prime Minister of the biggest democracy country in the world, Narendra Modi, in his election rally, he's taking my name seven times in less than two minutes. MashaAllah, I'm honored that the Prime Minister of India to win the election has to take the name of Dr. Zakir Naik, Hazam in Fateh Rabbi. I told them, you want an inquiry, we can have a video conferencing. We can talk. No, come here. People tell me, oh, Dr. Zakir Naik ran away. I said, no, I did hijra. And that's what a prophet did. When the prophet was persecuted in Makkah, which was the holy city, what he did? He did hijra. And we get guidance from that. If someone is trying to persecute you, or someone is trying to kill you, what do you do? It's not a question of running away. And after I came to Malaysia, there are many Indian dais and scholars who came to meet me. And one very famous dai, I won't take his name, he said, according to my research, no one in today's world has done hijra because you are the dai. You are the first one. We are only waiting for Fateh Makkah now. I don't agree that I'm the only dai, but that was his research. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah. And one of the reasons I took Malaysia, because percentage-wise, my following in Malaysia is much more than any other country. On my Facebook, there are 22.7 million people. In Bangladesh, about 6 million. Pakistan, 3 million. India, 2.5 million. Indonesia, 1.5 million. Malaysia, 1.5 million. But percentage-wise, there are about 19 million Muslims in Malaysia. 1.5 million of 19 million is approximately 8%. And everyone doesn't use Facebook. Less than 50% use. So percentage-wise, the maximum following that I have anywhere in the world, it's in Malaysia. And even the non-Muslims in Malaysia, to me, the general non-Muslim are very good. It is only the media which attacks me in Malaysia. It is only the non-Muslim politicians who attack me. Otherwise, I had gone to hospital last week. There was an elderly Hindu lady with a tikka. Dr. Zakir Naik, I'm your fan. Can I take photograph with you? So normally when with ladies, I always want, you know, a maram in between or a gen. So I said, if there's a gen in between, no problem. So she took. Then another person who came from a big company, I won't name the company, a Muslim came, Malay, and a Hindu. He said, sir, can I have a photo with you? Before that, I went to a doctor. And he looked like an Indian. I thought he was a Muslim Indian. He said, I cannot charge you. I said, why? I'm your fan. And he gave me his card. He was a Hindu. So like India, even the Hindus here generally are good. It is the political motivated people who for the vote bank like in India. Like in India, no problem with the Hindus. Even now, it is the political, political vote bank, non-Muslims who want to use religion as a vote bank. They are the problem for the Dawa of the Muslim all over the world. Same thing in UK, same thing in India. So the main intention is 
to use religion as a vote bank. So in India, I never had problem. Most of the Indians are fans of mine. Now, when they use the media, they spend millions of dollars in giving newspaper articles against me. Yet today, when I travel and I meet the Indian non-Muslims in foreign countries, they respect me. Even here in Malaysia, most of the Hindus I meet, they respect me. It's only those with the, with the group that belong to a vote bank. So these are the two problems of Adai. And mashallah, when I came here to Malaysia, my life changed. My Iman increased. My faith in Allah increased. All my properties that were attached, I told my wife, think everything is zero. If you get back, it is bonus. I didn't even bat an eyelid. Oh, we had a lot of properties, a lot of money, everything the government throws. No problem. What is money? All my business is gone. No problem. Didn't bat an eyelid. Hazam in first day, We restarted. No problem. Allah helps. And our requirement was very low. 2000 ringgit get nothing, right or wrong? MashaAllah, people from all over the world, Dr. Zakir, what do you want? Many businessmen, what do you want? We'll give you $10,000 a month. We'll give you $25,000 a month. We'll give you 100,000 real. I said, I don't require this. If I collected all, I could have worked yearly millions of dollars. I said, I don't require this. My requirement is only 2000 ringgit and I'm earning much more than that. And I kept on giving the percentage of income. Whatever I earn, I won't tell you the percentage, but majority I give in charity. For all, all the lectures, even today, I pay from my money. Air ticket, car, everything, hotel stay, I pay. I want to maintain even though all my properties have been attached, yet, Hazam in Fazir Rabbi. We never used Dawa as a way of earning money, never. The blessing that Allah has given us in the worldly way is far superior than other things. So my life changed, my iman changed. One thing new that happened, I wasn't too much attached to the social media because of Peace TV. When we came here, my social media, the YouTube at 400,000, within two years, now it is 3 million, mashallah. 3 million subscribers. My Facebook was 14 million, now it is 22.7 million, mashallah. We spend more time on the social media, Previously, we didn't have time to have weekly sessions. Now we have weekly live question answer session, which is a new series, mashallah. And that has changed. We have gone to different fields of Islam. We have, we met, mashallah, Allah has blessed that we met heads of states of many Muslim countries in the world, even non-Muslim country. I was advised, the religious advice to many of the heads of state. I don't want to name them. And we did what we could with, but always, Whenever I meet a head of state, I tell, I have to guide him closer to Quran and Sunnah. And every head of state I met, I saw to it that I gave them Dawa of Deen. I did not think that, okay, I'll be kicked out of the country. I never thought that, you know, I would be harassed. My job as a Dai is to deliver the message. Allah is there to protect me. And mashallah, we changed many things. Time will not permit me to what Allah has blessed, mashallah. But when we came here, mashallah, our ibadat increased. So someone asked me in the question and session, what is the daily routine? And that answer is for more than half an hour. I can't give it now. On average, in India, I have to sleep for three hours. Here in Malaysia, I sleep for about three and a half hours a day on average. Three and a half hours a day on average. Sometimes two hours, sometimes three hours, sometimes four hours on average. And you'll realize that all the people, all the people who, are, who have reached a level, whether right work or bad work or good work, they're sleepless. Most of them, if not all. And, mashallah, coming here, the faith in Allah increased, ibadah increased. First, you know, there are many things. Among the one thing that I increased, that first the tajud was there, it was small. Now the tajud is for about two hours every day, alhamdulillah. So, my working time in India was about 16 hours a day. Here it is about 12 hours a day for dawa. But my time for ibadah increased. My dawa time is yet there 12 hours a day every day. What I did in Bombay, we had the biggest, largest dawa organization in the world in Bombay. 
the biggest budget. We had more than 500 people working full time in Bombay alone. Then more than 100 people in Chennai. We had offices in London. Here, I decided where I'm living, I will not have many staff. I have only hardly about four staff, five staff. Bus. Then we have offices in other parts of the world. Because of Zoom, internet, it's easier. So where I'm living, I hardly have five staff. That time I had 500 only in one office in Bombay, one office. The largest private DAO organization in the world. You know, from a budget of 100, from a budget of only $200 a month, that is about $2,500 a year, it became the largest. I won't tell you what the budget was. Alhamdulillah, min Fazli Rabbi. And Allah blessed us. From a stammerer, He made me an Islamic orator. And my hijra from India to Malaysia, I never knew that my life would change so much. And we never regretted any time, anything. I only remember the statement of Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, when he was harassed, he said, that what can they do to me? What can they do? If they arrest me, I will do ibadah. If they exile me, I will contemplate on Allah. If they execute me, I will be a martyr, I will be a shaheed. Jannah is in my heart. So the more they are trying, Modi sent his emissary to meet me in Malaysia. He sent an emissary to meet me in Malaysia. Dr. Zakir Nai, can we remove the misunderstanding? I said, what misunderstanding? Your police, NI, knows everything about me. There's no misunderstanding. No, can we be friends? I said, no problem. As long as you don't tell me to do anything against Quran and Sunnah. I don't want your money. You know what they wanted me to do? They wanted me to support the government that what they're doing in Kashmir is correct. I said, nonsense. They gave me safe passage. We will get you back to India. We will delete all your cases. I said, what do you want? Nothing you want. Then they're going and telling me, can you say what the Indian government is doing in Kashmir, is right? I said, over oh, my dead body. In Kashmir, you're persecuting our Muslim brothers. How dare? It's totally wrong. Then they wanted me to support the new act. That is, citizen bill. That, and today, unfortunately, this fanatic Hindu organization, is really troubling the Muslims of India. Unfortunately, all the Muslim countries are silent. It's a shame. It's a shame. The largest population of any Muslim in the world today is India. The Muslims in India, according to me, are more than the Muslims in Indonesia. Officially, Indonesia is more. Because the government only says 14.3%, 200 million. According to me, it is 20%. More than 260 million. Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he utilize us in the best way that he can. We have dedicated our lives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah accept it. And whatever little we achieved, it is only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time our iman keeps on increasing. And I always tell, even in the Dawah training program, that there are three points of success. Number one, Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 160. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah, number one. Number two, Allah says in Surah An Kapud, chapter number 29, verse number 69. If you strive and struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up your pathways. If you strive and you don't get success, you are to blame, not Allah. Allah promises that if you strive, you'll get success. So I always tell my staff and my friends and my students, that if you strive, you have to get success. If you don't get success, that means your striving is not correct. And number three is Fasalu Ahl Zikri in Kuntum La Talamun. Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter 21 verse number 7. That if you don't know, ask the person who is knowledgeable. That is technique. But with all the technique in the world, if Allah doesn't help you, it's useless. I tell my son, fine, as far as background is concerned, in childhood, until the age of 27, what my son has got a background is thousand times better than me. Half is the Quran, knows Arabic as a language, 
graduate of from Imam Saudi University. But if Allah does not help you, everything is useless. I tell him that you should get Allah's help. That is the best. Degree is no value for the akhirah. What are you going to do with the degree? And only way you can get Allah's help is if you strive and struggle. See to it that you sacrifice. See to it that you sacrifice the things you like for the sake of Allah. And I always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may my children strive so that they get the help of Allah. Otherwise, without the help of Allah, all your knowledge, all your training, all your thing is useless. Zero. Have faith in Allah. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? Strive and struggle, inshallah you will be successful. Then ask the person who is knowledgeable. Any field, ask the person who is knowledgeable, inshallah, inshallah, you will get success. I have already spoken for more than two hours, I'm sorry. I have not even scratched the surface. I want to speak many things. I could not, the time was limited, inshallah, when I have the new series, which I intend doing, inshallah, in this year. Maybe more than 25 hours or maybe 30 hours, 40 hours, I don't know. Inshallah, that would be much better. I know I spoke a bit fast towards the end to cover more points. We have a limited time for the question and session. We had more than one hour, but now we'll cut it short to a lesser time. And if you have any questions regarding the topic, my life, my story, from a stammerer to Islamic orator and hijrah from India to Malaysia, you're most welcome to ask. See, this is the time, inshallah. Wa akhru da'wan alhamdulillah Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There's a quote once said, success is not about the destination, it's about the journey. So what have been shared by Dr. Zakir Naik is his journey, and I believe there will be some questions that you want to ask. So ladies and gentlemen, remember, question must be asked within the topic, which is Dr. Zakir Naik, his life and his story. So any question outside the topic will not be entertained. And whatever question you want to ask, whatever question you want to ask, please ask directly and avoid any, any mini lecture. And number three, you may ask one question at a time. And if you have any additional question, you can queue and ask for another question. So ladies and gentlemen, we provide with you two microphones. You can ask question directly to our honorable speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik. And remember, Dr. Zakir Naik will not go home without any question asked from all of you, ladies and gentlemen, members of the floor. Kalau kot bahasa Melayu nya, Dr. Zakir Naik takkan balik kalau tante tak tanya soalan. So mohon bertanya soalan, insyaAllah Dr. Zakir Naik akan menjawab soalan anda. Mikrofon disediakan. Silakan tante dan perempuan. Because our time is limited, I would like to limit for only two questions. Is it possible, Dr. Zakir Naik? Two questions, is it possible? Yeah. Four? All right, no problem. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, my name is Jahidul Islam. I'm from Bangladesh. I would like to ask you that you mentioned before that you are working on a movie. So my question is, uh, this, does Islamic movie can be a medium of dawa or it is uh, halal to be create an Islamic movie? The brother asked a question that he might have heard in some of my speeches, not today, before that I'm working on an Islamic movie. So can you have an Islamic movie, it's halal? It is possible, but very difficult. If it's an Islamic movie following the Quran and Sunnah, number one, they should see to it that it follows the rules of the Sharia. And if you strictly follow, then but naturally there should not be any music. Number one. Number two, but naturally you can't have females acting in that. Because that's against, even if they're wearing hijab, you see a lady on the screen, so that breaks the purpose of hijab. So if you follow the rules, it's possible, but very really difficult. So if you ask me, are there any Islamic movies available? There are, there are some, but very few. And the good quality ones are there, but they haven't followed all the rules of the Islamic Sharia. For example, the best movie that I know, the so-called Islamic movie that has been produced so far, it is the message made by Mustafa Akkad, in which Anthony Quinn was one of the lead roles. 
he acted like one of the uncles of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They never showed the photo of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alhamdulillah, which is perfectly fine. They did not show the image of any of the Fokhul Farashideen, but they did show the images of certain Sahabas, which is objectionable. But amongst the so-called Islamic movies, that was made the best. Then you have the Umar series, which is a 30 series made by BBC, funded by the Qatar Foundation. That's also beautiful. Again, there is music in it, but it is not obscene movie. So amongst the so-called Islamic movie, which is breaking the Islamic principle, but less as compared to others, would be these. They, they, they don't show anything which is obscene, but yet it is breaking the Islamic. And I, as a person, when I do something, I don't believe in 90% Islamic or 95%. If I do something, I believe 100%, I don't do it. So we were at a time, I was thinking whether we should make or not. And I was thinking of making a movie on Imam Bukhari. I want to take a personality which is accepted by all the sects of Islam, the Ahle Sunnah Wal Jamaat. So I thought that Bukhari would be a good one because he is revered by Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Malki, MashaAllah and Salafi. So there was at one time, but now we have got better projects and important projects. So I don't think so I'll be going for that project. Thank Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Second question, brother over here. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Zakir. My name is uh, Ahmad Zuhdi bin Suradin from Gombak, Selangor. Uh, some people were very lucky to be born in educated, practicing Muslim family like you. And chances to know and learn Islam is more as you are exposed to da'wah and to Islamic scholars since childhood. But certain people who were born in broken family, problematic family, uh, or with very up, uh, bad upbringing, which is logically, in terms of chances for them to know and learn, learn Islam is less. And furthermore, if they were born in non-Muslim family, theoretically, the chances for them to enter Jannah is less compared to lucky people like you. So people like this have been a big risk to become far from Allah and become kufur and atheist. I used to meet people who become atheists because of uh, one of the contributing factors is because of her uh, broken family. What, uh, and as we all know, Allah is justice. So what is your comment about this? Thank you. Thank you, brother. Doctor? The brother has asked a question very fast but I understood most of it, mashallah. He said that some people, I mean, I'm, by, I'm born in a Muslim practicing family. I'm lucky some people are born in broken families. What about them? Some people are not born in practicing Muslim families. So what chances that they'll become Islamic? Some are born in a non-Muslim family. So what are the chances? Isn't Allah unjust? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us example in the Quran. You know, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's called as one of the five mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His father was a mushrik. Right or wrong? His father was a mushrik. He tells his father that don't worship the Satan, worship Allah. He said, I'll kick you out of the house. That means Ibrahim alayhi salam was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of five mentioned in the Quran. His father was a mushrik. He kicks him out of the house. Yet he became a messenger. So where's the question of becoming a die? You have examples of sons of messengers of Allah like Nuh alayhi salam. His son, he didn't follow him. Noah alayhi salam takes a promise from Allah that save my family. Allah says, I will save your family. When the flood comes, I'm cutting the story short. When the flood comes, the water starts rising. His son says, I will go to the highest peak of the mountain. The water will not reach there. Water rises. And then when he's drowning, Noah alayhi salam asks Allah. He reminds him, didn't you promise me that you will save my family? What is the reply of Allah? Allah says, your son is not amongst your family. Allah is talking about the family of Iman. The family of the Muslim Ummah. Allah tells him that your son is not amongst your family. That means the family of Iman is much, much greater than the family of blood. You understand? If you have a Muslim friend, if you have a Mu'min, and if you have a Mushrik father, that Mu'min is much better. And Nuh alayhi salam then asked for forgiveness. So there you have examples in the Quran of sons of prophets who were mushriks. You have examples of the wives of prophet, wife of Lut alayhi salam, who did not obey Allah. You have the example of wife of Firon, a Tagut, the worst man in the world. His wife says, praise to Allah in Surah Tahrim, chapter number 66, verse number 11. Oh Allah, I would like to exchange the wealth. She was the wife of the richest man in the world, the most powerful man in the world. Exchange the status of mine 
for a house in Jannah close to you. What a dua. Imagine the wife of a Tagut. So you have examples. It is my formula which I told you. Did you hear my lecture? Three formula. If you, if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes says, who's, who's there that can help you? Let the believers put their faith in Allah. He killed every newborn male child. And Musa alayhi salam is brought up in the house of Pharaoh. Allah. He strived. He opened up the pathways. So Allah is just. Are you following Allah's commandment is important. So you have examples of people being in the worst family. Having fathers who are kafir, who are mushrik, who are ta'gud. They become messengers. You have examples of children of messengers, wives of messengers. They disobey. So Allah is just. Allah tests different people in different way. And you have examples of all this. If you follow Allah, you follow the Quran, inshallah you'll get the best of this world and the akhirah. Hope that answers the question. All right. I would like to invite among Muslimah. There's a, I believe there are two questions behind there. So please, our sister over there, what are your questions? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, every uh, participant in here. I am Karina Arianti from Indonesia. I want to ask about the some of people trying to memorize of all al memorizing of Al Quran because of several reasons. Like, uh, look. Can like you speak a bit slowly, sister? Slowly. Can Pardon? you speak a bit? Can you speak a bit slowly? Take it easy, slow slowly, and steady. <laughs> okay. So yes. the conclusion is many people trying to memorizing of Al Quran because uh, not because of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because of several reasons like look like religious or some several requirements academic. So what do you think about that? And uh, can you give advice or or impact when the people make it? Okay, thank you. I wish you and family uh, in great condition as as always. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sister, that's the question. If I understood correctly that we should remember the Quran for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some remember it for academics or some remember it, uh, memorize the Quran maybe for fame. Some people may memorize for earning money. If you memorize for academics, you can memorize for academics and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together, no problem at all. If you are memorizing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you say, I want a certificate, I want a sanad, no problem. As long as the niya is for Allah. If you are near that you only want to memorize the Quran for making money, Allah will give you money in this world, but will not give you sawab in the akhirah. If you say I want to please it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make it a zariah for my living, no problem. It is permitted. The Prophet permitted that, but don't unnecessary charge high. If you charge exorbitant, then that is wrong. But if you teach the Quran, and if you take a normal fee which is justified so that you can take care of your family, it is acceptable. Because it is better to teach the Quran than to teach English language, right or wrong? When you're teaching English language, the person may come close to thee, may go away from thee. So as long as you do not break the boundary, if you say I'm a good kari, I'm going to charge 10 times more, then that is wrong. But if you're going to charge normal, which is acceptable, it is permissible. If Allah has given you wealth and you teach free, it is the best. If Allah has given you niyama and you teach free, it is very good. But if you charge within limits, it is permissible. It's not haram. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, thank you, doctor. All right. Oh, brother over there, your question? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. I'm Muhammad Siraj Nabi. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, actually, uh, I want one suggestion from you. In our today's society that, oh sorry, uh, I collect from your speech that when you are talking about the Mary. So in our today's society, if we're telling to our parents about our Mary, so they're telling me or they're telling us why you want to get married right now. Complete your graduation first, get job or do something. After that, you should think about your Mary. And then when we are talking with our parents, uh, they're saying that why you want to get married right now? This is not the current age. But they are doing relationship with the girls or the girls doing relationship with the boys. This is the haram. When we are talking about why you are doing like this, this is haram in our Islam. They are saying that yes, this is haram, but you should not get married right now. So I want your suggestion 
which is the is right age to get married thank you sir so was asked the question that which is the right age to get married a parent don't want to marriage early you know they said delay do education etc the best guidance is given by our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's mentioned hadith of sahih bukhari the prophet said oh young people whoever has the means to get married should get married so prophet advised that if you have the means get married as early as possible and for a marriage for a man the moment he becomes an adult he becomes the balik he can get married same with the woman so moment you get balik if you think you have the means to get married you should get married that is the advice of the prophet if you ask me personally if you ask me why say that today is age because people have education etc so i normally advise that if a boy wants to get married i think that okay if he wants if he wants to become a graduate a normal person becomes graduate at the age of 21 so i say for a man the best age is 21 he can get married early if he wants but should not delay too much because the fitna is more for a woman she can get married at the age of 19 and you can even continue education after marriage this is my suggestion islamically earlier the better but seeing the scenario that if you want to be a graduate and get married on average a person becomes a graduate at the age of 20 or 21 normally unless you know there are some problems you can so my suggestion is that okay good age is 21 22 for a boy if you want to get married early it's good it's mustab there's no problem at all as long as you have the means but don't delay too much because the more you delay there'll be fitna regarding your pants i'll come to it later on the more you delay there are more chances you'll do haram activity you may get involved in things which are obscene you may get involved in zina and that's a major sin as far as education is concerned you can very well continue education even after marriage there's no restriction what's the problem what you have to do is make your needs less if you say i want a very good car i want a very big house i want a three bedroom apartment that is the problem i would say make your needs less and get married you can very well rent the apartment so if you make your needs less and get married earlier there are many benefits i've given a talk on this the benefits of marrying earlier you know you'll have children faster you can retire faster you can spend your way for allah faster so my advice is to the girls and boys get married as early as possible the moment you become adult as early as possible normally i tell in today's age for a girl maybe 19 20 for a boy maybe 21 22 I say you can marry early also, but don't delay too much. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. All right, brother over here, your question. Salam uh, alaikum, Doctor Zakir. I am Nasser Al Khraz. Uh, I am from Yemen. Mashallah, tabarakallah, Doctor. You have knowledge in different. Can you just remove your mask, please? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yes, that's better. Uh, mashallah, Doctor. You have knowledge in different fields uh, and uh, powerful mind. So, could you please share what techniques? Did you use uh, to study and to learn more? And what advice would you give us as uh, students to be like you? And thank you. So, with that, the question that, Mashallah, Alhamdulillah, I've got a lot of knowledge in different fields. He wants my advice. What technique did I use for getting all this knowledge? In my speech, I gave you three formulas. Correct. Number one is the help of Allah. Surah Imran, chapter three, verse hundred and sixty. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forces you, who is there that can help you? Number two, is strive and struggle in the way of Allah. Surah An Kabut, chapter twenty-nine, verse sixty-nine. Third, I gave you first alu al zikri in kuntul atalamun. Surah Nahl, chapter sixteen, verse forty-three. Surah Ambiya, chapter twenty-one, verse number seven. Technique. You are asking me the third most important. Why don't you ask me the first important? You don't understand. The third. The third most important is technique. Which is the most important? Remove. The virus will not come to you, no problem. The, the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So you should ask me, how should I get the help of Allah? You are asking for the technique. If I tell you number one, number two, number three, which should you ask? Number one or number three? Technique should be number three, after the help of Allah. So what you should ask me? How can I get the help of Allah? You are asking me, can you give me the technique? Yeah. Bro. This is. most of them you should ask me how to get the help of allah to get the help of allah number 1 is read the quran read the translation understand it you are masha yaman you may be doing arabic as a language correct yes you may be understanding the quran if not full at least part yes you may not be knowing lugha fusa but you understand part correct yes 
Yes, true. So if you don't get the pafalla, you will be questioned more than, more than me, right or wrong? <laughs> so you knowing Arabic should get more help or I should get more help? Uh, yeah, I should understand more. Than me, correct? Yeah. You should get more help of Allah than me, right or wrong? Yes. I'm getting more. Why? By the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you are not reading the Quran. If you read the Quran and you understand the Quran and implement on it, lazim, you have to get the help. Number two, you have to strive and struggle. Did you strive and struggle? If you strive and struggle correctly, if you strive and struggle and you don't get result, that means the striving and struggling is wrong. What did I do? I wonder that there are, according to me, there are hundreds of thousands of Muslims who are more knowledgeable than me. Much more knowledgeable than me. Why do people come for my talk? Hazam in Fazirabbi. What did I do? Nothing. Okay, I sacrificed my medical profession. No sacrifice, according to me. No sacrifice, according to me. I think I established her. Why do people come to listen to my talk? Hada min fazde rabbi. If Allah puts in your heart, come for Dr. Zaki in the lecture, you came. So you have to satisfy Dr. Allah. Correct? How you satisfy Allah? Follow the Quran. Quran says, you know, me and my wife normally have discussions, arguments. And she knows only way she can convince me is Quran and Hadith. So because I sleep less, on average I sleep three and a half hours. My wife tells me, the Quran says, the night has been made for you to sleep. Correct? I give the argument. Allah also says, blessed are those people who sacrifice their bed for sake of Allah. So both are arguing from Quran. You understand? Right or wrong? So if you sacrifice your bed for sake of Allah, Allah will give you success. Right or wrong? Telling you to read Tajud. Correct? You understand? Yeah, yeah. So if you follow the Quran, the Quran is a niyama, is a guidance for the whole of humankind. Strive and struggle. How much are you doing for sake of Allah? Okay, you know that if you do this, you'll get dunya. If you do this, you'll get akhira. You do it, Allah will give you dunya and akhira both. That's the formula. Technique is last. Technique is last. Then you, first Allah's help. Second is striving and struggling. Then you ask an expert. If you want to know something about finance, you ask something of finance expert. If you want something to know about Dawa, ask a person who is expert in Dawa. If you want to know something about Deen, ask the person expert in Deen. Now Allah wants to see you that do you want bachelor's in engineering or bachelor's in doctor or bachelor's in Islamic studies? You have to choose. Correct? So you have to get the help of Allah number one. Strive and struggle in the way of Allah and then ask the expert in that field and Allah will give you success. Hope that answers the question. All right, thank you very much. That will be the last question for tonight because of our time constraint. Can we, I think it was supposed to be 12.30. Pardon? It was planned to be till 12.30. 12.30, is yes. it? Yes, so inshallah, so we can continue till 12.30, inshallah. All right, therefore, I would like to invite uh, our sister behind there. She's been waiting for quite some time. Our sister behind there. Yes. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Marwa. I am a student from Indonesia. Uh, from the story you told before about. Can you remove the mask if it's not for Naka breathing so that we can hear clearly? If it's for Naka breathing, you can keep it. The, the voice is not here. Cut here. Okay. Jazakala, sister. Okay. Uh, from the story you told before uh, about your journey about dakwah, so it interests me uh, to do the dakwah too. But I'm as a Muslimah and as a learner, so can you give me some tips or suggestion? Sorry, sister, I couldn't understand your question. Can you repeat the question a bit slowly? Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, can you give me uh, some suggestion or tips on how to start the da'wah with a simple things in an early age? Thank you. Sister Das. An important question that how can she start doing dawah in a simple way at an early age there are you know many dawah training programs that are conducted and according to Sheikh Ahmed Didad when he, he conducted many dawah training programs and I wanted to tell this I didn't have time 
Allah has given opportunity. And he was very disappointed. From right from 1988 till the next few years, he conducted many dawa training programs for two months, you know, many, but he was very disappointed. When I went to meet him in 1994, or in 1994, he told me, son, who has trained you? Who trained you? Did anyone train you? He said, no. Well, I personally wasn't trained by Sheikh Dita, never. I was a fan, uh, except for one two hour course we did on combat kit. I never was officially trained by him. I saw his cassettes and I picked up. He told me, son, who trained you? Did I train you? I said, no. Who trained me? No one trained me. Allah trained. He did many courses. He was not happy at all. Then we conducted the course, the first Dawa training program in 1999. We called 20 students from all over the world. And we did a training program. And the same three formulas were there, which I told. Then we conducted a second program after 16 years. In 2016, time did not permit me, therefore I did not, did not speak about that. We did a Dawa training program in 2016 and we received hundreds of applications. We selected 20 students from 12 different countries. And mashallah, Malaysia was number one. We selected six students. Even in the first training program, maximum was Malaysia. In the second, six were from Malaysia. Two were from Singapore, one from Japan, one from UK, one from Netherlands, one from China, one from Saudi Arabia, three from India, 20 people. <coughs> and this training program, we recorded, it was an extremely different program. It was a professional program. We did the first program in 99, then after 16 years in 2016, January. This program, we recorded on 14 4K and 8K cameras. It was for 45 days. Every week, two days were holiday. The working days were 33. And officially timing was from 10 to 6, 8 hours. Unofficially, normally went for 10 hours, 11 hours. And the recording is done, sister, on it. The complete program has been recorded. And now it is being released on our new platform called Al Hidayah. Now, this program was recorded on the best of cameras so that it could be for 50 years. What we have done now, we have made study guides out of it. And for this program, for this one program, Dawa training program for 20 students, you know what was our budget? Our budget for 20 students was 2 million US dollars, 8 million ringgit for training 20 people. 8 million ringgit, more than 8 million, 2 million dollars. The main reason was we had the best of facility, best of cameras, best of stage, LED lighting, fantastic. So if a person can speak on the stage on our Dawa training program, he can speak on any stage. Now this training program has started being released every month we are releasing two, two courses. We have launched a new platform called Al Hidayah. It's available. You can type Al Hidayah, A-L-H-I-D-A-A-Y-A-H. And this has many courses. It has my section and other speaker section. There are 40 other speakers. In my section, there's myself and my son. In my section, at present, there are more than 23 courses. My son's about six courses are there. And one of the best courses that is there is the International Dawa Training Program. This Dawa Training Program, sister, if you do, it's a 45 days crash course. If you do it on the internet and spend a few hours a day, it will take you a couple of years because it's a voluminous course. It is total 350 hours of recording. The total course is more than 650 hours you have to spend on it. And the courses have got module. Introduction then, Dawa to Christian, Dawa to Hindu, Dawa to Atheist. So based on that, if you hear these courses, you'll find the technique You'll find the material, you'll find the study guide, four color study guide. This is the best that I know of. And you can see it as many times as you want. So if you go to the Alidaya platform and subscribe to it and do these courses on Islamic Dawa training program, that is the best that I know of. It is a technique based program, also has got knowledge, has got study guide, has got a lot of resources. You can do it in the comfort of your home. And inshallah, 
it will give you a lot of information and if you do the homework as prescribed in the course then practically you can do dawa hope that answers the question sister brother over there your question yeah yes assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, hold on hold on brother over here yeah this one yeah Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Louder, a little bit Quite skip uh, Is it okay? Okay My name is Atma Farhan uh, From Perlis I have a question Can you speak closer to the mic? About Hablu bin Allah And Wahablu bin Anas Hablu bin Allah And Wahablu bin Anas If We are doing a mistake To the people but one day we want to apologize to him right but when we try to find him he is so difficult and in a situation maybe he, he died and my point is what's your opinion all right what to do Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. If I understood the question that if I made a mistake about somebody and you want to apologize, you find it difficult to find him, what do we do? Correct? Okay. Yes, yes. What does that question do? What that question got to do with the topic? I can answer that question. What does that question do with the topic? My life and my story. Because when we doing something, right? Brother, did you understand my... Yes, yes. What has your question got to do with this topic? Because when we uh, go through our career like you, going to that war, some of the people not like us, right? And sometimes we make a mistake. Uh, when we don't... Okay, fine. You want to try and fit that question to the topic? Like when you do dawa and you make mistake and you do something wrong, if you don't find the person to apologize, he dies, what do we do? Yes. If you know that you have made a mistake and you have sinned against someone, as far as possible, try and find him and ask forgiveness is the best. If you cannot find for any reason, you ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Best is to ask for him directly because you have done something wrong. That is the best. If you cannot for any reason, you ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah Allah will forgive you. Hope that answers the question. Inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Zakir Naik. Okay, brother. With uh, the white shirt over there. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, doctor. Uh, my name is MD Mohiyuddin. I'm from Bangladesh. So, my question is uh, I saw so many people uh, in our country, Muslim people, they're wearing a uh, uh, golden ring or uh, and silver ring. Uh, as a Muslim, is it uh, what do you think? Is it uh, halal and haram? I feel since the time is limited, we take the question on the topic first, out of the topic afterwards. Answer is easy, but Oops. anyone who has a question on the topic, my yeah. life, my story, I don't wear a thing, silver ring, uh, I sorry, don't wear a gold ring also. I ask off topic question, sorry. Yes, so you can go behind the queue and inshallah, if time is there, we'll entertain it. Uh, okay, can we have the next question, please? On the topic, my life and my story. After the question on topic is over, we can enter. Can you go behind the queue, please? Yes, brother. Let's turn to the next question, please. Can you focus on the topic? On the yeah. topic, my life, my story, from Stamira to an Islamic orator, and Hijra from India to Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Saeedur Rahman from Bangladesh. Can you remove the mask, please? There is no nakab for you. Sir, I'm Saeedur Rahman from Bangladesh. Yes. Sir, my question is, uh, if my future target is to be uh, like Dr. Jackin Naik, then what should we do? What should we do now? The brother asked the question that if your future target is to be like Dr. Zakir Naik, what should you do now? That's a good question. First, I would say that depending upon your age and what you're doing, I'm not aware. But generally, I would say that if a person wants, not that whatever Dr. Zakir Naik has done, you have to do, because I did many things that I should not do, but Allah made it possible. So best number one is that if you are a child, see to it you put your child in Islamic school, number one. After you grow up, if possible, see to it that you join a graduation of an Islamic studies. Join an Islamic university, 
the best ones are in the Gulf country, whether it be Imam Saud or Jamitul Imam, it can be Madinah University, it can be Ummul Qura, it can be in Qatar, it can be in, it can be in UAE. Non-Arab university best, IIUM is a good university. I think Islamic university is also there in Perlis. So join an Islamic university, do Islamic studies. If you want to do Dawa, the best would be Sharia, so that you can answer questions on fiqh. If you see to it that you, if you can do his, though Zakir Naik is not a Hafiz, but Allah has helped, I can quote from the Quran. If you are not, try and become Hafiz of Quran. Learn Arabic as a language. And then, after that, while doing this, you can do the course on my platform, Al Hidayah. So, first is Islamic school, you're already out of school now. Join, become a graduate in Islamic studies if you can, whether it be Sharia, whether it be Hadith, whether it be Tafsir, whether it be Islamic studies. You become Hafiz al Quran also, learn Arabic as a language, look up Along with that, do the course on Al Hidayah, International Dawa Training Program, and inshallah, this will, depending upon how much you strive, depending upon how much you please Allah, how much ibadah you do, how much tajud you pray, that much Allah will help you. How much you sacrifice. If you want to be Dr. Zakir Naik, see to it that major portion of your income you give in charity. Whether you're earning a thousand ringgit or whether you're earning a million ringgit, see to it that you give more than 50% of your income in charity. Start with this and inshallah Allah will help you. Hope that answers the question. Thank right. you. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. Brother over there. And please make sure that your question is relating to the topic. Okay, inshallah. Yeah. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Dr. Uh, I am Shafiq from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I am a student of Sharia. Okay, a lot of uh, Malaysian today know you as a good da'i. And they even recognize you as ulama. And they also protect you if those uh, liberal and atheist people condemn you in the social media. However, some of them say... Uh, you only can be referenced about the cooperative uh, religion uh, but if you talk about the Akidah, uh, they say, uh, don't listen to you. Uh, can you uh, comment about this issue, Dr. Thank so you, that's brother. That's the question that I am specialized in compared religion but if I speak on Akidah, don't listen. Anyone speaks. Number one is, Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ هَاتُ بُنَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ But if you are truthful. Produce your proof if you are truthful. Anyone. He may be illiterate. Correct? If he tells you anything, ask for proof. If the proof is there, you follow it. If the proof is wrong, reject it. What thing I told about Akhida without proof? Can you point out a single? Can you point out a single thing which I spoke without proof? So irrespective whether the person is an expert or not. If he speaks to you with proof, and if he's giving you Dalil, it is sufficient. The Dalil should be correct. You have to take out fault in the Dalil, not in his degree. You know, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, only six standard pass. How much? Didat is how much? Six standard pass. Not even school. He will take the PhDs of comparative religion, lock, stock, barrel. Right or wrong? Yes. Right or wrong? Yes. How much six standard pass? Not even ten standard. Didn't pass the school also. Because Allah helped him. Correct? So the problem is the Dalil he gives is carries weight. So the problem is that anyone who speaks, you have to see is he speaking on the basis of Quran and Sunnah or not? Whether he's speaking on Tafsir, whether he's speaking on Hif, the Dalil. There's no Dalil required. What you have to see that the thing is, that's why I tell my son, studying university is good. Degree is no value for Akhira. The problem is what Dalil you have. And at, if you see the Sahabas, did they go to universities? They sat with the Prophet. They sat with each other. The best way of acquiring knowledge is Sitting with scholars. Sitting with scholars is one of the best ways and reading the books is the best way. University is good. It gives you a view okay that you have studied something. But the main test is how you sit and how can you reproduce. That's important. Anyone says, ask him, even if a person of PhD, if he misquotes the Quran, will you follow him? No. If a PhD of Tafsir of Quran says there's two Allah, will you follow him? Uh, you follow him? Wrong. No. So main thing is what you are going to speak. The degree is important, okay, for those people who you don't want to test. Correct? Degree means, okay, you are done. You get that. But main thing is whether the person is speaking the haqq or not, he has dalil or not. 
Dalil is the main thing. So always ask for Dalil. The problem is those people who cannot refute, they give these arguments. Hope that answers the question. All right. Uh, doctor, is it possible? And this is the last question from, from the sister over there. Sister? I think we'll continue because it was supposed to be for three and a half hours the program. It can go until cow to one. Till they want to ask, no problem. Okay? All right. So we can go until cow to one. If, they, if they're tired, we can stop. Sure. So we sister? can have maybe another two rounds. We can have, inshallah. <laughs> Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Dr. Zakir Naksar. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It, your lecture was so interesting and beneficial for me. My name is Javeria. I'm currently doing my A-levels. Just like you, I, would to, I want to pursue my career in doctor and be a da'iya of our beloved Deen Islam. Please, you give me some guidance. And please, do all for the successful of my future. MashaAllah, sister, I said that she's doing A-levels. And she wants the guidance, and the same guidance what the sister earlier asked is that I would want you to, if the best profession, I started my talk, I didn't have time to give the translation. So, Jazakallah for reminding me. I started my talk with the verse of the Quran from, from sorry, Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 33, which says that, Waman ahsanu kaula mimman da'ilallahi wa amilu salihau. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, who works righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim? According to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best profession for a Muslim is not a doctor, is not an engineer, is not a lawyer, it is of a da'i. Allah says in the Quran, the best profession is of a da'i. I chose, I wanted to become a doctor because I thought it was the best profession. But when I read the Quran, when I met Didat, I realized. I wanted to become a doctor because I wanted to help the humanity, which is good, it's not bad. But I found a better profession. Allah says, Woman Ahasan Kala Mim Mandai Lahi Wamal Saliha, Wakala in the Mil Muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord? <coughs> Works righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim. My mother, she wanted me to become a heart specialist, a Chris Bernard. Chris Bernard also happens to be from South Africa, like Sheikh Didat. And she wanted to become like Chris Bernard. So when I got involved in the field of Dawa, when I met Sheikh Didad, and I asked her that, Mother, Mommy, do you want me to become like Sheikh Ahmed Didad or like a heart surgeon, Dr. Chris Bernard? So she told me I wanted to become both. You know, she was intelligent. Then later on, when I got more involved in the field of Dawa, when I started giving lectures, when people started getting Hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I asked her the same question a few years later, that, Mommy, do you want me to become like Sheikh Ahmed Didat or Dr. Chris Bernard? She said, I can sacrifice a thousand Chris Bernard for one Sheikh Didat. So, the best profession for a Muslim is Dai. There's no better profession. I would not like to change my position for anyone in the world. Now, past, there are many. In the world today, I would not like to change my position with any king, with any prime minister, with any minister. With I, Allah has blessed me, mashallah. I'm not saying that I'm the best person, but what Allah has blessed me with giving me, made me a da'i, alhamdulillah. So for you, sister, also, the best profession would be a da'iya. And I would request you that after you pass your A-levels, you can learn Arabic as a language. You can join any graduation course of Islamic studies whether it be Sharia, whether it be Tafsir, whether it be Hadith, and get involved in it. And as far as getting trained for being a Dai, you can refer to the Ali Daya platform, which has the course International Dawah Training Program. And inshallah, you'll get many tips from that, inshallah. Mm -hmm. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He make you a successful Daya, and may He give you the best of this world and Akhirah. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, just I wanted to say that my brothers and sisters are a little reluctant on to study, so please make dua for them also. And may I get an autograph? Sorry, I didn't understand the last Yeah, last the last question. words. Yeah, my brother and sister, my younger brother, are, are, are a little reluctant in studying, so they don't enjoy much studying, so I would like you to make dua for them so they Inshallah. enjoy Inshallah. May Allah make them, make them the best Muslim and Muslimah to follow the deen and study and even spread Allah's message Inshallah. Ameen. Yes. I, I was just asking for an autograph, the last one. 
Inshallah, after the, after the program, Inshallah. Later on, Inshallah. Okay. Thank right. you very much, sir. Thank May Allah bless all. you always. Thank you to all who ask questions. And ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived to the end of our program. So I would like to invite Suhaibu Samahah Dato' Arif Perkasa, Professor Madia, Dr. Asri bin Zainal Abidin, Mufti uh, Government of Perlis, accompanied by Tuan Haji Muhammad Nazim, Haji Muhammad No, Chief Executive Officer of MAIPS, Ustaz Amir Ikhwan, uh, Deputy uh, Assistant Director from JAIPS, representing the Chairman of the Mosque, Zamri Vinoth, CEO of One Centre Malaysia Perlis. Please uh, come upon to deliver a token of appreciation to Dr. Zaki Naik. Dr. Mazar and uh, Mr. Zamri.